Boom. Smile pretty. Absolutely. Hey, Bruce, have you ever done any uh, improv training classes? <laughs> Not at all. Monday was my first night DMing. This will be great. <laughs> uh, welcome to Fighting the World, episode three. I am Wistrick. And I'm Bruce. Um, so our panelists from episode two, which was Talk to the Game Makers, had so much fun talking to you guys about the logistics and the considerations that go into planning scenarios for Rapier Melee, um, that we're going to do it again. But this time, we're hoping to do a little bit more of a practical demonstration of live, on-the-fly scenario building as it would happen uh, for various events across the known world, um, encountering all of the variables possible, including some of the ones you wouldn't necessarily think about. Uh, and the goal here is good scenario design um, and what it has to address as determined by you, the audience, us, the moderators, and um, fate. Uh, the war points here, they don't matter. This is going to include a lot of audience participation, so I would ask that you guys uh, don't be shy in typing at us. Wishrick and I will be reading through and picking things as we go uh, to throw at our panelists. Um, we're not necessarily going to be using every suggestion because I need to get up early in the morning, um, but we're going to need your help. So please be on your toes and try to um, type at us as fast as possible because I'm gonna try and make sure that we keep this moving. Um, but if you come to us a little late, it's okay. We'd rather have the suggestion there than not because we may actually be able to run this twice tonight. So the first question while we continue through the introduction is I want you to pop into chat the kingdom you come from. Uh, Wistrick and I will be your DMs, I mean moderators this evening. And while I'll be prompting you for things, please do not be shy about typing responses and comments and thoughts into the chat so that we can maybe use it to uh, help make our panelists' lives a little bit harder. Um, so first up, I want to have the panelists quickly reintroduce themselves. And we're going to start with Warwick and just go down the line. I'm Warwick uh, from Ontier. Um, I've been playing in the SCA for over 20 years. Uh, White Scarf Master Defense, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've been doing um, Melee. I, I started out in Melee. It was my first love. It's really what got me into it. Um, and I've been uh, running war practices and de designing scenarios uh, through that entire time. And uh, coincidentally, I'm also, uh, I work professionally as a game designer. Okay, uh, next up is going to be Hawk. Hi, I'm Hawk from Trimemis. Um I've been in the SCA Somebody has to math, something around 17 plus years, uh, rapier fighter, white scarf, mod, so on and so forth. Um, I'm currently co making uh, Golf Wars with Master Westrick over there for next year. I've been involved at a KRM plus level for Golf Wars for, I think I said it was eight or nine years, which is a little scary looking back on. And so it means that I've done a lot both as a general and as creating scenarios and dealing with scenarios and running scenarios at large events like that. All right, excellent. Thank um, you. Mundanely, I work as an elementary school teacher, so you might notice that show up as well. What? That's why she's the marshal in charge. <laughs> this is why we get name tags. And milk oh. and cookies. <laughs> and that's why we also periodically get talked to like we're second graders, because we deserve it. Yeah, Avery. that's because you're you, yes. Avery. Could I have yourself. you mute your mic, please? You got it. <laughs> All right. And last but not least is Oliver. Hello, I'm Oliver. I'm from Kaid. Uh, I'm Master of Defense, White Scarf. Uh, I've been playing since the 90s. Uh, and I started designing scenarios back in about 15 years ago. I, I teach a class on breaking down all the diff different bits and pieces that go into scenario building. So you can get a basic understanding of how you can build and rearrange scenarios and put them together to have fun. All right. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, and thank you guys in the audience. It looks like tr our uh, special event is going to be in Trimaris. So we're going to really rely on you to tell us what's going to happen and what's not. Um, I know Hawk can keep us a little bit honest here. <laughs> 
considering she might be from there. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build the background of the scenario before we let them start really planning. Um, we know now that our event is in the southeastern coastal United States on a thing that looks kind of like a pan. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to ask you guys what size should this event be. So I want you to listen to the letters I say. There are only three. You only have to keep track of three. Uh, and pop the letter that you think this event should be into chat. So A is going to be a small local kingdom event. So you're only going to have a maximum of 30 fighters. B is going to be a baronial war, which is going to be about 60 to 100 fighters. And C is going to be a large war like Penzik or Gulf Wars with 300 to about 600 fighters. And since we're in Trimaris, it's probably going to be mostly like Gulf Wars. Um, and I'm going to give them a couple of seconds to type stuff into chat. And I want to hear quickly from the panelists. I'm going to open it up to all of you very briefly. Why is the size of the event important for planning your scenarios? I'll start. The different size scenarios, depending on the number of people we have on each side, will determine whether or not certain scenarios will work well or they will fail. If you have something that works better with 20 people on the side, it may not scale up to having 100 people on the side and vice versa. Also important uh, to know how many people you have compared to the size of the, uh, of the fields or the area that you have that you can play them in because uh, field battles with 20 people are very different than field battles with 300. Mm -hmm. There's also a slight difference um, how complex you can make a battle that has 300 people and you have to manage to explain to 300 people from around the known world versus how complex a battle with you know, 20 people who are all local and all used to it. Slight difference between how complex you can get in terms of the explanation and whether or not they read the rules beforehand. Well, it absolutely looks like it's going to be B, um, the panel. They're, they're taking it easy on you guys. So that's oh. a baronial war, y'all. Uh, it's about 600 to 100 fighters. And we are in the southeastern coastal United States. And uh, now is the time on whose scenario is it anyway to draw a theme from a hat. I'd like to thank a lot of our audience for submitting these earlier this week. Um, and just so you know that I'm not cheating, they're all in here. And what have we won? Oh, a new car. A new car? No, new I wish. Car. I don't a new car. So a new car. car is the AOA rapier fighter. So, <laughs> <laughs> you so get a car and you get a car. The event theme for this is odd things I found in marginalia. Okay. You like the fighting bunnies? Like the fighting bunnies, like the penis trees, like the very, very blase people getting scabbed. <laughs> Cool. Um, that was I, a good suggestion. I like I that. Could see. Who that was, submitted that? I believe that was Chrissy who submitted that, who I know is in our chat. I want to do that. Uh, <laughs> so that's our theme for this evening. Um, the next step is going to be the field size. And I am, um, well, first things first, I'm going to ask the audience if we should have wooded terrain or an open grassy field. And um, one for wooded, two for open grassy field. And I'm going to, while you guys are typing that up, I am going to pull the size of the field. I have numbers ranging from 100 feet to 2,000 feet uh, based on the Penzik field, which for reference is about 1,200 feet by 2,000 square feet, or 2,000 feet. Okay, so. All of uh, it. Marginalia is the stuff that, you know, when you, when you see the scrolls or when you see the, the calligraphy and the illumination, the little figures on the side that are doing weird stuff, you know, the trumpets in their butts and I'm uh, sticking on sticking an example in the, in the mirror in a second, oh, there we go. it's loading. <laughs> Got it. Oh, so, what a yeah, stuff. Just, you just nailed. Just come to the South for civilization on this one. <laughs> So 
uh, the hat was kind to y'all. The field is a thousand feet by five hundred feet for your usage. Who Ooh. on earth are we finding that? <laughs> I don't know. But, New event site that we apparently found. <laughs> but the audience was a little bit ruder to you and has suggested that this be a wooded field. Ooh. Awesome. Wooded All right. So we have a wooded field. Uh, could you repeat those measurements for me? Uh, 1,000 by 500. 500 feet. So for wooded reference, it's about field. half the size of the Penzik field. Okay. So that's roughly the size in my head of like the the field outside, the field, the wooded area that we fight in at War of the Wings. Mm -hmm. Is anyone familiar with that? Is that roughly what we're, we're looking at? I, I believe so. I think that would actually how, be a very good, um, a very good. How densely wooded is this? Well, how, how about flat we roll, is this? How about we roll a die? Um, right here, I have an eight sided die. Uh, eight is super wooded, one is Florida sparse. <laughs> All right, you ready? And anything it in between is. is equestrian park. Right. <laughs> uh, so we got, oh my God, seriously, we rolled a four. Perfect. Equestrian park it is. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's enough woods that the woods are creating some, um, you know, actual terrain, but not so much that I can't theoretically from most places in the woods see the majority of people in the woods. You're not really going to be able to hide, hide in the trees. All right. Not for the most part. So... We had the question of a permanent structure in here, but because we decided to go wooded, I'm going to skip that. And the next consideration I have for specifically Hawk here, since you're from Trimeris. Um, so, uh, Bruce. Yeah? I have seen a permanent structure, well, permanent structure house made in a woods battle by stringing a uh, rope between trees and hanging sheets off of it. That is not a, a permanent structure. Woods. That's a temporary structure. No. <laughs> Just because you are from some very scary places. <laughs> that is terrifying. Look, look. That wasn't a structure. That was you doing laundry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're just going to wash the suit. Um, so I'm going to skip the permanent structure because we have an interesting set of terrain here. Um, and I'm going to let the... I'm going to let the panelists get kind of creative with this uh, because we, we don't have time to like, pull up actual maps. But the next question I have, and I'm going to aim this specifically at Hawk, since Hawk being from Trimeris will know a little bit more about this. I've been to a couple of events in Trimeris and around that area, and I've never seen hay bales. Um, why? What's the consideration on getting hay bales somewhere like Trimeris? Um, honestly, we don't tend to have a lot of large enough we, um, melee type events to uh, support the use of hay bales. Hay bales, for anyone who's not played with this, hay bales are expensive and they're kind of um, a bit of a waste resource. Like you use them and afterwards you don't tend to do much with them. They kind of, they're probably going to get exploded over the course of the war. They're going to fall apart. You're going to lose some of them. It, it, they're not a great resource. So, um, especially if anyone's gone to golf for us in the past couple of years, they've seen that we've moved away from hay bales and started doing those pipe PVC structures that are a little bit more, a little bit more solid. They're a larger cost at the beginning, but after that, you use them year after year. So that's how we usually see hay bales. Um, at Trimarian events. I'd assume that this event, even though we're calling this Trimaris, it would probably be, you know, Trimaris versus Meridies, um, possibly an event in the technically Meridies against Atlantia, something something against another neighboring kingdom, as opposed to just pure within Trimaris. So somewhere up in that panhandle area, panhandle skirmishes is an example. This year we're gonna have a, a, a nice panhandle skirmishes with a theme. Thank you, work. That's exactly what I was uh, going to ask you to do. <laughs> Start adding some trees to our lovely map. So thank you very much for that insight. And uh, so the next question I have for the audience is how long should this event be? Is this a week long? Is this a three day? Or is this a single day overnight camping event? 
Um, and please also pop in the chat what day you think this battle should be on. Is it at the beginning of the war, the middle of the war, or the end of the war? Um, and then I am going to be a magnanimous DM because I know that if Hawk was in charge of a baronial war in her neck of the woods, she would be hella prepared and have things like flags and stakes and paint and tarps and whatever else she needed or would bribe someone to go to the local box goods store to pick it up for her. So we're not going to, we're not going to go into that for this one. Um, are there so any, part of, sorry. Part of the reason why we're asking a little, little bit about when in the war it happens is because sometimes uh, the ravine is a great example of golf wars. It's the last battle on the last day of a week long event. Um, Personally, I hate the ravine at that time. I really want to move it. It's on my goal list because people tend to be getting tired. Tempers tend to be getting a little frayed by that time. The ability to do more complicated things starts wearing away at that time. It's just, it's a small consideration, but when you get larger and larger events, it is something to think about. <laughs> All right. So it looks like the audience wants it to be a three-day event with the, um, with the battle in the middle because on Saturday, I would assume that that is the middle of the war, being that Friday is the first day and Sunday is usually the last. Um, the day with the most people that would be there. Right. The bigger battle. Absolutely. Thank you very much, audience. You guys are really on top of this. And I apologize for like really awkwardly looking over here to try to read through it. Um, okay. Hey, Bruce? Yes. Uh, real quick, uh, to counterpoint Hawk there on the hay bales, on the West Coast, especially down in Kaid, we use hay bales a lot. We rent them and return the ones that aren't broken, which is we use, lose about 10%, usually on the heavy field. Um, <laughs> but for us, we don't have the ability to have places where we can build permanent structures uh, as easily or store that. So we, we rely heavily on hay bales. So it just, it's just different in yeah. kingdom anthropology. Mm -hmm. Which is part of the reason we're here and really lends itself to the next question I have. Well, and it might be, you know, things go moldy in Florida. Yeah. And, in and, and weather related was the other thing is we yeah. have very little rain. Right. I expect that the <laughs> hay bales just last longer in storage there. I saw that hog. So yeah. that leads itself beautifully to the next question I have for the panel as you guys are working on designing your really beautiful map there. Um, I did <laughs> kudos to Warwick. I know, I, I'm really <laughs> impressed. Uh, <laughs> that is a very nice looking map. It kind of looks like the 100 Minutes War site, actually, out east, um, where they have the rapier battles with the little islands of trees. Why do we have a snail? <laughs> oh, never mind, it makes sense, marginalia. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the next question I had are, are there any event specific rules that we're gonna have to follow because of where this is? Um, and what would they look like? I know with Gulf Wars, there are a lot of really interesting rules about like no DFB, no shield sizes, and oh, heaven forbid, if you stab the queen, do not stab the queen. Um, what type of interesting rules would the audience expect to see at this event? <laughs> Can I tell them we're changing them? <laughs> um, so I, I realize we're slightly skipping well, we're advertising ahead to, Gulf Wars. Uh, <laughs> to, our, to our good friend George, um, which is that when Long we hit these rules, so for, yeah, so, um, I haven't even George pulled George out yet. <laughs> I know, but it's, it's going to slightly show up in a moment as you guys come up with these rules for us, which is that one of the considerations is, for example, in Trimeris, we don't typically do DFB because we don't do DFB at Golf Wars, and we don't do DFB at Golf Wars because we don't, yeah, it's a circular logic. It works great, I swear. Um, but depending on who the crown is, or whoever's in charge of this event, whoever has the end here, say, of this event, it might be that we go, you know what? We really want to do DFB at this event. This is a great way to start playing with DFB. How do you feel about this, Your Majesty? And if we're fighting against another kingdom, how do you feel about this both sides? So it's, it's something that might be considered. Personally, I love DFB, especially in a woods battle. I think DFB can be a big game changer. Um, and so it's going to kind of turn into... If, if y'all say no DFB because it's Trimeris, can I ask the crown to say no? 
<laughs> well, we might come to that. So the George that the wonderful panelists are alluding to is going to be our game changer for the next step. So step two is going to be them beginning to design this game, which they've already drawn out their map, but they need to start looking at things such as win conditions, the format, um, some of the other things that are very important in planning a scenario for Rapier Melee and having it be successful, which if you've watched our previous episodes, you would know we have defined as having fun and staying fairly safe. Um, so King George, because I have been watching a lot of Hamilton, uh, is our <clears throat> graceful and magnanimous king who has a lot of opinions in supporting Rapier. And he will be coming up later uh, with certain rules, regulations, uh, requests for our panel. <laughs> Um, I do have one last question, actually, as we sat here and we kind of created this event. Um, and I can kind of answer what it would likely be in Trimaris based on how we've described this. But something to consider is what I will call the seriousness of the event. Um, basically, whether or, whether or not you can bring out rubber chickens. Um, for example, at a, if, we were, if we were fighting at Penzik and we were fighting a war, a war point thing at Penzik, it, there has to be a slight element of seriousness to it. it. People really care about who wins this. Like it's a big deal to a lot of people. As opposed to if I'm, you know, doing a baronial, baronial event and you know, it's the, the theme is the princess got bride. Obviously, there's not such a big deal on who wins it. It's more about the fun, more about the theming. So, I would assume that this event is a fairly non-serious event in terms of of that sort of thing. You only say that because we're dealing with people jousting with snails. That as well. <laughs> Somebody chose <laughs> odd things found in marginalia as the theme for this event. And therefore that that does kind of tell me this probably yeah. isn't that serious of an event. That, that's not so much a, a royal measuring contest at that. Yeah. It, I mean, maybe the queen is a laurel, but anyway. Okay, so audience, maybe I- the king is. <laughs> I've seen a very interesting- Maybe she's a knight. <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. Um, I've seen going on. Interesting discussion about what time of year it is. And I'm going to say that this is peak event season. This is when it is safe to be out and when most of the events happen um, in the Southern area. So, Hawk, what time of year is it? It's the fall. October. Perfect. All right. So the next question I have for the audience is how serious do you want this event to be? Is this Penzik 50 years of huh, riding on it? Or is this <clears throat> a much more relaxed local baronial war where they play uh, the Outlands drinking game. What type of event is this? I think we said that when somebody chose marginalia, like the chances of this being serious are low, but hey, I mean. I mean, is this penis low or is this like killer bunnies low? Like, we're, we're getting some, uh, 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 <laughs> looks like a couple of votes for relaxed, one for not at all. Oh, one, for snails. one for moderate and one for serious. So all right, so let's, go yeah. let's, let's go with relaxed. Yeah, let's go with relaxed. We can't we can't go down to penises, but bunnies are okay because we'd like <gasps> to keep this family friendly. No, 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 no. no. We just take the well, cool it was noodle. family friendly until you said that. <laughs> I yeah. said the word penis go, like genitalia on the YouTube channel now. <laughs> no money. We may not penis. use genitalia. You can just call them Richard birds. Richard birds. Oh, I like that. All uh, right. What we need to do is to take some pool noodles, put them in the trees, and then people could fight with offhand pool noodles. Save that for later. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so we're now uh, we're now in what we called step two in our outline of this. <laughs> they're not bad mods. They're great mods. That's why they're here on this very prestigious panel. Um, so we're in step two right now, which is what we nicknamed "get cracking." Um, they're going to start planning this because they have all of the background. They know some of the logistical concerns. And as we present certain challenges and certain 
benefits to this scenario, um, they're going to hopefully be flexible around that. Um, so I would like to hand it over to the panel to let them plan for, I'm going to say like five to 10 minutes and I'll jump in as things are going. Um, so let's go. Go panel, All right, go. So what do we, what do we want as our win scenario? Is that a pond? That's a pond. Warwick? Yeah. Okay. Warwick loves ponds and he actually has a really great, fast, easy way to make them, which is that you basically take a blue tarp, which we have a lot of in Trimaris, and you just tack it to the ground. Ta-da. Um, so is, is this battles a res battle usually... or a non-res battle? I would say res battle, um, just because we, I'm going to admit that... Can we back up just a bit? So, sure. With, so the idea of marginalia is going to inform the theme, and the theme can help us decide what we want, to, what kind of battle we want to have. How are we going to use the theme to inform the battle? So I one of the things go ahead. I thought Just, of, we got not... snails, we got snails and bunnies right out of the gate, right? Yeah, and go ahead, Hawk. But I'm going to talk to you after you do. Um, one of the thoughts was, uh, have you guys ever seen like the wheel of spinning secondaries? Yeah. Um, here. And so something like that, where there's some whether it's by sides, one team's the bunnies, one team's the snails, or whether it's by person where they draw out of a hat in some way, or it's somebody who is chosen tabarded out of the group who represents these killer bunnies and they have some special power, whatever it is. Same thing with these killer snails. And bunnies riding snails with their power so when combined. I at, when I look at marginalia, people are always picking things out of trees, um, they're always pulling things out of other people's bodies, but it's always about collecting stuff. And I'm wondering, since we have a forest, if we can if we can bring a collection element into this. Um, That's an idea. Collection. And we're back to you, pool noodles again. Well, it doesn't have to be pool noodles, but maybe maybe you can have you can put things in trees. Maybe it's pool noodles, but maybe they have regenerations uh, in them, or they have well, other special boons that you can use to to uh, protect your side. And by, if, we, if we do that, it'll force the sides, which are large, to uh, break themselves up into units to go and search for these things. And you'll end up having more small unit combat in the forest, which is the right way to use a forest, really, other than just have the two sides clash in a line in the open space in the middle. Yeah, the reason I was going with pool noodles, since she didn't want to use the word Richards. Right. Um, we could we'll use noodles. The noodles. pool noodles would be the Richards that are in the trees, and you can collect all the shiny Richards that are there. Um, the other cool. thing we could do is, is have certain people on each team be either snails or rabbits. The snails could only be allowed to walk at a slow pace. The rabbits could be allowed to run. The snails, if you poke a snail, it kind of draws in its shell and comes right back out. So they, they could die in place if they die and then resurrect right again without having to go back to the res point. So I'd like to just remind the panelists that this is a baronial war with two sides between probably Trimaris and Meridies or Glen Aubin, one or the other. Um, so use that as you will. So how are you guys feeling about, uh, about uh, trying to force them to use the forest? <laughs> I like the idea of trying to, I, cause Forests are one of those things, especially when you get a little bit more sparse forests, where there's a, a bad possibility of it turning into a lion battle. And it's kind of a waste of a good forest. How about we also, we could also uh, make uh, killing somebody uh, have a, a, an additional benefit to you. They could have something on them. They could have a flag or something on them that you take and that you can bring back to your re regen point and it's worth something. Uh, I thought the, I know the points don't matter, but when you've got a space like this, collecting things, uh, it just seems to really, uh, collecting things off your bodies. Um, when you're in a place, when you're in like a, that. if you're in a forest, and uh, you really have an opportunity to sneak around and creep, and uh, maybe you come around a corner, you're not even sure if that's one of your units. It could be the other side, right? I think it would really add an interesting element to it. So I'm suggesting we sort of jam on how we can keep them in their units while they're out there. So one of the suggestions I just saw from the chat might be to collect manuscript pages. Yeah. That could Ooh. be a token for that event. Um, but first but not least, boom, crash, King George has come to the party. Excellent. And King George has seen the 
new rapier spears and is very interested in them. I know is. we're in the woods, so... Does he have an authorized group of knights? Authorized in rapier spear? <laughs> I can't answer that question. He, he only gave me some in. details. <laughs> he only gave me some um. details. But he's very interested in them. And if you can't implement rapier spear, spears, is there another way to um, let people play at more of a distance? I mean, in honesty, this is one of the... <laughs> I'll back table. I'll, I'll, I'll bono that for the moment. Um, because I will admit, if we, if we look a lot of these pictures of marginalia, it tends to involve a bunny rabbit with a spear um, riding a snail. Of course it does. Um, which could be a very interesting way, is the only way that you're allowed to, uh, to use a spear is if you have your snail right next to you. Um, otherwise you lose your spear power. But I'll say that we'll, we'll, we'll get back to his majesty and we'll let him know what we can do with that. We're looking at the rules and seeing how many people are authorized. We'll get to you back to your You bury the shovel him? Did you just bury the shovel, King George? <laughs> we'll stick a pin in it. That's how you get a fully armed battalion. Take an awesome suggestion and, and, and give it due consideration, your majesty. Um, so the, the nuclear option for anyone who ends up in this situation, for the record, is the very useful phrase, it's not safe. And I mean, obviously fun, Try not to be a, a, a Debbie down on. I mean, I have to consider is it safe at the moment because uh -oh. so few people authorized so because we've been under quarantine, nobody's really gotten to play with it. I'd say no, but pretending that this event takes place two years from now, that's not nearly as much a consideration. So wonder, we're collecting I, things, I, I think was a good could, idea. I wonder though if we could find a couple fighters who'd been part of the experiment on each side that we could give them special snail slain powers or rabbit slain powers with their spears. Yeah, and I, I think that's what we were, that's kind of what I'm thinking of it. Let's kind of get the, the bare bones of this scenario first and then we'll figure out how to work, how or if to work spears into it. All so right, we've got all two right. sides. You're, you're, you're mad like <laughs> Yay! Your Majesty, are we expecting roughly equal sides? Uh, so, yes. For this one, okay. we'll do equal sides because I was rude to you last time. <laughs> what are our what are our numbers again? Uh, uh, this is a baronial war. Sixty to one hundred. So. Right. Yeah. Could you give us a bit more specific uh, day count there, Bruce? Oh, Forty. Hey, side. hey, audience! How many people are gonna roll up to this event from we Meridian? Don't no. Somewhere between sixty and a hundred. That's yeah. That's that's, that's what you got. That's, so you're not getting that many fences yeah, from Meridian's for idiots. We're gonna go with sixty to hundred and probably closer to the sixty than the hundred <laughs> between those two kingdoms, just based on the area it is. October is a busy month. Blah blah blah. All right. Two so sides. I, Our uh, goal is that we are trying to collect something. That's what we're going as our as our win condition. Uh, we said it was a resurrection battle. Um, gonna move to yellow for our battle specifics. As battle, um, what are we collecting? And are there? Is it just generic? Collect as much as you can, or are we doing some version of you're trying to collect specific things? Like only certain things are worth points to collect. Well, if we go back to marginalia, we can we can definitely look at things. I like the uh, the scroll bit. We could either use paper or have a set of I'm just watching somebody almost run into my fence. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's about all the uh, distractions. <laughs> or tear up some, some broadcloth into sizes that we could use, and then those could be scattered about. Yeah, I really like the idea of making them fairly easy to see, but not necessarily easy to find. Like, you, you know, you've got to search around for them. So you've got parties out there searching for things and trying to kill each other. Um, is so, it worth so actually, having... I want to highlight something that, that Oliver just did there, because um, it came up in our run-through of this. But in the run-through, we were talking about how do you mark people, and we said, well, you, know, you get tabards. 
And, you know, now we're talking about like, how do you have these markers for whatever it is that we're going after? And, and people might think, you know, hey, let's, let's get some, you know, actual pieces of paper or something. And in both cases, I think Oliver said, you just take some cloth and you tear it into strips. And, you know, for the first one, you make a sash. And for this one, it's a strip. Uh, because I think people put a lot of thought into infrastructure and that they might be discouraged from trying weirder, more complicated um, scenarios because of infrastructure. You're, you're absolutely right. You just go to the local thrift store and buy a couple of sheets and away you go, right? We often, yeah. we often just use flagging tape for things like this. You just hang it off the belt, right? If you really wanted to, you could have people just do instant scroll work on them with permanent markers, just something basic. I'd have it do, I'd give it as a kid's activity. That'd be awesome. Yeah, on the first day. Day, yeah. day, day one. That's a Friday thing. Yeah, Friday, it's a kid's activity and you, you know, you hand out more of them doing court and make people make them doing court and, you know, tie them with ribbon. Um, do we have decoy scrolls? Are all scrolls worth the same or are some of them worth more or less? What are the scrolls worth? Is that our win condition purely of max number of, we'll call it points, based on scrollage? I think there should be just a set number of good scrolls that are worth points and a whole bunch of worthless scrolls that are from the, I don't know, some other kingdom like the East that... Uh... <laughs> be nice. So how about instead of worthless... And there's the inner kingdom incident I knew what we'd cause. <laughs> so here's an idea. Here's an idea. Um, instead of having a regeneration, uh, instead of having uh, a, to, to have to go to a regeneration point and wait, we can make regenerations, flags, or something that you've got on your body, and you can have a certain number of them. Everybody starts with one, but you can get more. So some of your decoy scrolls, when you unroll it, actually has more flags in it. Yeah. Right? And or so, it itself okay. is a regeneration. That's right. So then you can pass them out among your squad and everybody's got an extra, you know, three extra lives or something like that that you can pass out among your squad. So all the scrolls are worth something. Uh, there's, a, there's a set number that are needed to be found for a win condition to be uh, discovered, but the rest of them have other boons in them. So some of the scrolls are basically regen, uh, regen tokens and some of them are um, point tokens, we'll call them. So are you doing limited res then? I would, I would suggest that everybody has a, a set number of regens to start and you do that with giving them, by giving them flags that they hang on their belt. Um, uh, and then they can find more. A additionally, I would say if somebody has more than uh, 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 one regen on them, um, and, and bear with me here, if you kill that person, and they have more than one regen on them, if you have an opportunity to, you can take what's left. Uh, getting a little complicated and getting into some, yeah. some arguing on the field. All right. Yeah. Um, so you just have to turn it into the uh, marshal to, to get something. So yeah, I, I, think I, would I agree suggest, I would suggest you have marshals on the field rather than a, a specific regen point. So you have, instead of having to go all the way back across a thousand feet, you just have various, because you're going to have field marshals out there anywhere with, with staffs watching things. So allow them to go to their nearest marshal to regen. Okay. Battle snail. <laughs> uh, the Trimerian battle snail for those is a wonderful, wonderful um, lady in Trimeris who happens to be in a wheelchair. And we once gave her two shields to cover her wheels, two spears to hold, and somebody to drive. That's amazing. And uh, amazing. Trimerian battle, ba battle snail. So how so do looks we, like we need, uh, we need an elephant then. We need a what? An elephant. Oh. I'm looking at... Uh, at Marjuna. So uh, we've got this idea of, um, of the, the manuscripts. I think we've got a pretty good idea surrounding how we're going to use the manuscripts and there's some boons attached to them. How do we use the actual things in the marginalia? The obvious things, of course, are, are the, the snails and the rabbits, but there's all sorts of other stuff. How do we use that to theme? Are we going to theme the sides? in that fashion? Are we just going to give them, you guys are snails and you guys are rabbits? Or are there going to be special things attached to being a rabbit or a snail? The autocrat has stepped in and said that the barons are being given rabbits on one side, snails on the other. 
Um, okay, you so anything it's else versus snails. at your whim. Uh, the autocrat has also asked, I just got off the phone with her, um, that the points at the end be discernible so that they can judge who has won the baronial war. Got it. So it's not just it's not just uh, most points win, it's that number of points go to your total baronial score? Yep. Okay. Uh, if I could suggest to the autocrat that, you know, there's some sort of points for whichever side turns in the most scrolls for us to use for this. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll give her a call back. Yeah, <laughs> let her know. Ask, ask her um, how many points we can give out. <laughs> uh, let's say you guys have a maximum of 10 points. Okay. In that case, you can have, so is it possible that uh, we could have a tie and both sides get five points? Yes, because every other activity has been given points. Okay. It might be more, okay. if you want a clear cut winner, you need 11 points. So perhaps we could have additional things besides the scrolls on the field. We could have two or three rabbits and two or three snails hidden out there as well. And if, if you can get those back to your side, you get additional points. So you get, um, you have to get the one that belongs to your side. So if you're on the rabbit barony, you must get the rabbit if you're on the, um, yeah. okay. I'm gonna put that as a, I'm gonna put those as stuffed animals or again. Actually, uh, here's, here's, here's an idea. Um, so instead of having the regen points be the marshals, let's actually make the regen points be at the other end. But if you can find one of your rabbits hidden out there, that becomes your new regen point, which gets you closer to the center. Oh, so it, it doesn't move. It's just it's an extra regen point that your yeah, side can use. You can now regen would, once you discover it. Uh, as opposed to making it a, um, what about an making it a marshal? I was going to say, make it so a roaming you, marshal. You're going to, uh, well, I, I, I think you would get rid of the room if we're going to do this, if you guys like this idea. And so, <clears> you, so you would start here where your rabbit is, and you would start here where your snail is. That's where the two sides would start. And that's where the regen points are. But over here in this forest bit here, there's a rabbit or a snail, I should say, hidden. And if you can find it, now you have two regen points. And maybe there's another one over here. And if you find that, now you have three regen points. So finding your, finding your snails, which might be little hidden flags or something, uh, gives you more regen points, uh, places to regen. Um. So the only thing that shows up when you put regen points in the middle of the field is the other side camping that regen point awesome. is the only thing that sometimes shows up. And you're right, that is a, that is a possibility. Um, if that regen point is instead of being a point, it's a line. Or a person. Or a heck, What's even a- person who finds it? Or a person is that what about moving Depending on what we have for scenarios, is it possible to move the... Um, oh, a line. I see what you mean. So across the whole field now, it becomes... Yeah, any, so... You, you behind that, now you regen. Yeah, that works too. And maybe maybe what it is, is as opposed to there being a, a snail right here, the snail stuffed animal is over here. Right. And if you get that and bring it back to your regen point, now your regen point suddenly moves up 10 feet or whatever. We're getting a little complicated with this. So everyone knows right now we're kind of spitballing a lot. Sure. And just because we're giving these ideas, not all of these are gonna show up. This is just this kind of, and this is part of it, is be willing to come up with crazy, random, wild things like this, even if they're not perfect. And you're gonna, you you're gonna look at it and you're gonna fall in love with an idea. You're gonna think it's amazing and you're gonna wanna put it in and then you're gonna play test it. And you're gonna realize it was a terrible idea. Um, so is there any objective other than collecting, any wind scenarios other than collecting, um, scrolls? I think well, we all kind of liked that, collecting, collecting scrolls. I think, I think we I think all liked that. I think it's gotta be the scrolls because are we, are we, are we talking unlimited regen or are we talking limited regen? Um, I think doing it as, because Trimeris is hot, even in October, there's no month that is not hot. Yeah. I'd kind of want to run this multiple times, do multiple short ones, right. as opposed to yeah. one long one. So limited regens, you can scatter some regens in some of the manuscripts. They can switch sides, they can do it again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then your win condition is having the most manuscripts, and that can be because you've killed everyone else and then found all the manuscripts. 
Um, is your win condition, your win condition is most point manuscripts. Since we're, yeah. So some manuscripts are not worth points, they're just worth regens. Yeah. Some but manuscripts if there's, if are there's worth 11 on the field, points. once all 11 have been found, the scenario's over, right? And you just count them up. Miguel actually had a kind of, kind of interesting suggestion. Um, the times that the regen points differ in the time you have to wait. So Ooh, the good. idea of some of the, some of the, um, Ooh, okay, so what about some of the manuscripts? So some of them are points, those are easy. Some of them are regions, and we may or may not play with that. Some of them being, we'll call it superpowers. <clears throat> and it has to be things that either it only applies to the person who got that, or it's something that's very blatantly obvious to the entire field that this superpower has now come into play. So how about there's no shields or case allowed on the field, and, but if you find a snail, you get a shield. If you find a rabbit, you can have a case fighter. Case fighter. I like that. Put multiples of them out there, you can hand it to someone else. Yeah. Okay. I'd almost go the other direction because since snails have those two eye stalks, it's kind of case. <laughs> and the rabbits are the ones with the shields, right? But snails have a shell. That's, that, yeah, I, snails I, have I, a shell. Like, I'm sure we can, you could theme it however you wanted, but that, that's, that, that, those are two things that I always see in Melee, right? Yeah. And we can just say, um, no, please, it's sword and dagger uh, uh, or sword and, sword and cloak, but there's no shields. And obviously you'd have to be, you must be authorized in this style. I can hand it to someone else who is. Do we want, uh, since His Majesty wanted spears, do we want that to be one of the things that you can get? Oh, maybe, maybe that's... The, Maybe the rabbit. rabbit. Yeah, the rabbits get the spears and the snails get the shields. And then um, what about, I, I kind of am looking at this elephant picture up here that's got a gazillion people on it. Um, either that or choosing something else marginal. I mean, this very strange one. I mean, maybe a unicorn, you get case because, you know, they had no idea what unicorns looked like. Um, okay, I believe unicorn means one. That is exactly why they should absolutely get case based on everything <laughs> else that that um that I've Actually, seen in terms No, I love it. Hey, I love audience. it. I love hey it. audience, anything else you can suggest as uh for using for case? Otherwise I'm sticking unicorn for the moment. But well, what's what's wrong what's what's wrong with rabbits having case and unicorns having spears and snails okay. having shields and it's not it's not it, it maybe it doesn't even matter what side you're on. You, no, it doesn't fine. at all. Right, you find it. You, you just find. Uh, do we want a, a superpower for the elephant? What would that be? Jeez. I don't know. Any other any other superpowers that the audience can come up with? With Drake, you totally just seeded this to make them overthink everything with those pretty pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Did I? Um, actually, there's a question. Oh, here's I your, mean, your right. elephant. Your you elephant. go back to Wistrick's idea your of having a laundry on a, on a string. We could do some PVC, make, make the box that everybody's in, put some stuff down on it, and you could have everybody running around on the elephant inside the box of PVC that you can't attack them below the waist or below the, the box that they're in. Oh, that's cool. I don't know if I would. It's put cool, but complicated. Box, I, have, I yeah. have a different idea for the elephant. So okay. we have a regeneration rule where if you are killed, you have to go and regenerate. Elephants okay. don't have to move to regenerate. They just have a five. They can regenerate on the spot? Yeah, the five count and they regenerate. Uh, uh, so who do they give their, so they only get that one time, it sounds like. Well, what if, they, if they've got three, if they've got three regens on them? Like, and maybe when you find the elephant, it comes with three regens, right? So you stuff them in, it's got special instructions, and or you, you TRP it beforehand. So it's just, yeah, you've got basically three lives and you don't have to go to a regen point to use them. Um, I might do elephant as you get, uh, just because you start getting complicated and what if you pass it to someone else who has more lives. Elephant is a single regen, you find the nearest marshal, you hand it to them, you, you, marsh, you can regen right there. I'm thinking about trying to explain people. That's the other, I know a couple of people have said, oh, they need to be stabbed this many times. That always ends up, uh, again, turns into things that um, lead, I'm thinking about things that lead to arguments on the field. 
Yeah. No, I so stabbed you three kills. times. No, you couldn't count. So short, simple, easy I things that two complex. The marshal in charge has heard this entire conversation and hates the idea of the elephant. You I, get I, elephants going away. Superpowers <laughs> on the field. <laughs> I'm you know, no, 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 no. Hawk is the marshal in charge. Yeah, this is true. She's down for this. I'm sorry. The Kingdom Earl Marshal has heard <laughs> this. <laughs> you're, you're not the Kingdom Earl Marshal. You're King George. Oh, shit. King George says he hates elephants. He's scared on. of elephants. Lord, Moving on. On. Okay. So here we go. So there are various scrolls within the woods. Some of them that you collect are regen tokens. Um, Let's talk about the mechanics of that really quick. It means that you have a marshal at each resurrection point, and their job is to collect those tokens as you use them. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to get rid of the, I, I think I don't like this stuffed animal as your secondary regen point, because we've already got a cool superpower thing. Yep. Um, if you find the snail, you get shield. If you find case, you can, sorry, if you find the rabbit, you can fight case. If you find the unicorn, you can fight spear again, assumes that you are authorized in that style and it can be handed to someone else. So yeah. Manuscripts can be handed to people until they are used. Um, and we can color these different things and you have to you know, put it somewhere on you. So when you find a manuscript that's worth points, uh, do you keep it on you or do you take it and hand it in somewhere? Now that point has been earned. It is not earned happen? until you turn it in. Right. I agree with that. It so is up to, to you. To, uh, when, to give it to a marshal, to a specific marshal, to a specific place. When po res point. So any res point or the original res point. We're going to stick with a single single res point for the moment. I think adding multiple res points is getting a little complicated yeah. since we've already got this special rule set. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm conflating the two. Yeah, res battle. Res person to go to turn in points there. Um, if you get, if you have, so here's a question. If you are holding the point manuscript and for whatever reason you are working your way back to res and you get killed, can the other team take it? Yeah. Like if you don't I'd get say, yeah. Point. Everything you get yeah. should drop. And that, that should drop. I, I don't think that your regens should drop. Because no, not the regens, kind of but the, the points should drop. Oh, what about, what about special... here's a question. Yeah, powers, do those drop? I think the powers should drop. I kind of like powers dropping. Powers yeah. and, and, and point scrolls should drop. I like Pascal's, Pascal's question about, um, are some of these, these, you know, animal things negative? No, because that person would, if you make something negative, chances are they'll find the manuscript and pretend they didn't. Yeah. It's like, oh, I didn't see this. Yeah. Well, you could always make a monkey's paws. What a uh, define? Well, they, they come with a, a, a plus and a minus. Ah. Uh, you know, you get to fight um, with spears, but you can only fight, you know, you got to hop. I don't know. I, of course, we would never do that, but that, that would be yeah. useful, right? Um, somebody said never, rabbit case, never. and I will, I will absolutely do that. Rabbit, you can get case or dagger. Everyone starts single. Okay. Everyone starts single so, sword, no RBGs. Oh, we could bring RBGs out too. Tremors <laughs> doesn't tend to do RBGs. All right. So. Because again, Golf Wars doesn't blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> in the event that His Majesty King George wants RBGs, we'll, we'll create another animal that will turn into RBGs. Um, Okay, when killed, everything but we gen tokens start. Uh, I don't think we need a river, unless you're feeling particularly squashy gooey. Um, uh, if you step in a pond, does that kill you or does that knee you? I, I think it'd be more fun if you could knee walk through them. Okay, uh, knee walking in woods. Knee walking in woods? Yeah, yeah, knee the, walking the woods is not. Oh. You'd actually be no, knee walking on a tarp. But. It's a safe. Oh, it. Sure. Um, but I get it. Yeah, it's fine. I don't know. We we do we we have like 
20 outdoor events a year, so we need walk on everything. I mean, <laughs> we have safety, alligators. Your safety for getting stabbed is or is is your opponent's and your responsibility. Your safety for knee walking over sharp stuff. Well, if you guys so then oh. just make them just make them impassable, and they just become they become obstacles, right? Okay. And then they become more trees, and yeah, then they're just trees. But you've already got trees, so what's the point of having them? It's more fun if if there's knee walking. Yeah. Um. What about if you? Step on one as opposed to knee walking, you sit. You can sit anywhere on that top. You can't leave the top. You don't swim well. You can't get out. <laughs> or you can stare at a death. Up to you. That we might be getting complicated. We lose, we lose fun if somebody has to spend five, ten minutes of the scenario sitting in, a, in water. Suicide is always acceptable. <laughs> what a hard end. Yeah, I've been, I'm, my rule, my rule in melee for what it's worth is suicide is always acceptable. Fire ants. Somebody mess, can be mentioned. What blow? Any blow can be lethal. Yeah. Um. So I'm not sure how I feel about the pawns. I think pawns are one of those things that. When we show up, we might look at him and go, eh, there's not enough trees here. Oh, look, no and pawns. we throw them in. <laughs> Ta da! Either, either that or the pawns make you drop all, everything. Anything that you have carrying your res lives, any scrolls, no, any powers, you just drop them. I, I very much would prefer not to have people drop um, any gen tokens because that takes you out of the game completely. Like, you touch a pond 10 seconds in, congratulations, you sit around and stare for the next 20 minutes. Um, back to that. So let's talk about time here. Uh, run it, I assume, three times. How long do we want each battle to be? The battle time depends on who, because they have limited reses. It'll be whenever one side has either been completely incapacitated or all the winning scrolls have been found. Yeah, I'd say but we could we could max ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Well, I'd say let them run it once, and if they're done and under ten, do it a second time. And if the same side wins it twice, you're done. Um, I think you you plan that you will run it more than one time, just because yes. that tends to be one of those things that um. It's a fun thing. You want people to have fun up yeah. for the maximum amount of times they can play this because it doesn't it doesn't matter who wins per se even though there are points, we want to keep them occupied and have them having a good time. Makes sense. So play three times, play until all points are scored. Um, so quick question, uh, the whistles are supposed to be marshals? Yeah. Perfect. It's the best I could do, sorry. No, no worries. No, that's I think it's cute because you actually say, oh, the marshals are going to stand in specific places. And I tend to be like, ah, oh, marshals, go stand where stuff happens. Well, what I usually tell them to do is this is your zone to be in that yeah. zone. Yeah. Okay? So for the panel, um, for an event this size, which is probably capped at about 60 fighters, maybe 100 if you get really lucky, how many marshals for a scenario like this in the woods is – I'll say sufficient. I know it depends on the terrain, but what what kind of what are you looking at? What is part of that decision making factor in I'll, making sure that this stays safe? I'll take as many field marshals, which is people with staffs around the edges, as I can get, and I'll put them in I'll put them in helmets. Um, as for the field, um, you know, we, what do we got? Sixty people? Did we say we got uh, 60, but, people? sixty to hundred? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if we had a hundred, I would probably add two more marshals. It's the size of the field because it's a uh, five hundred by a thousand feet, which yeah. is a large field, and the marshal can only see so far through the woods. And they're going to gravitate. Able to, they're going to gravitate to the action, right? So yeah. Enough to be able to do that because there's going to be all sorts of stuff happening everywhere. Yeah. So we're going to need enough marshals there to be able to see every part of the field at any given time. So the well, other kick the is, are. well, we're encouraging the fighters to be doing small groups. Yeah. So I that, mean, that is a, everywhere. a thing. Um, I'll note that one of the things is this, um, these resurrection 
I called the marshals. Those don't have to be marshals. No. Those can be anyone. And that's a great place to stick. You gotta laugh at this. Teenagers who are too young to fight. That's one of those places like that can be a great job for them because it is requires, you know, a little bit of responsibility. I had one at Gulf Wars where I needed somebody to keep time. I literally had a five-year-old keeping time with a cowbell and her mom was there with a watch. It's also a great um, place to put a couple of pop-ups so people can dump water and gear and stuff there. In the yep. Yeah. Uh, I have one question and now I forgot it. Um, um, all right, so I know you have a question. Mitz. You have 10 minutes to finish your planning session. King George is on his way here uh, to see you play test the scenario and talk about what's important in the play test. So. Okay, so uh, question, are all the manuscripts the same color? You don't know what it is until you open it? Yeah. I think so, because that way you can't go look for the green one. Okay. Um, manuscripts are all same oh, color. Oh, I remember. So because we're going to break these guys up into units, it's probably important for the sides to be able to identify each other fairly easily. Uh, Masking even, tape. Yeah. Duct tape on your helmet. Sure, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make sure. Team, blue that, team. That's pretty typical at a Gulf Wars. I don't know how much, how typical that would be at a Baronial, but when you busted them up like this, I think it's super important. Yeah. So let me, I'm going to go, uh, Get rid of our river because we don't have a river, and I'm going to start putting some bigger. I need a color other than green. Um, now we're talking about a slightly more war specific. I forgot oh, what there is to zoom out on this. Yeah, scroll wheel or the zoom out button in your bottom right hand corner. Well, that was too much. That was too little. So, um yeah. We're, unless the king says bad things, we're going to say that DFBs are allowed. It means that because I know it's not that common in my kingdom, I'm going to have to spend at least a little bit of time actually training it beforehand. Um, my personal rule on running, and again, other Armex can jump in on this or anyone else, is um, I've started calling it matched running engagement, which is means that you should, you can safely, it's a word, safely move at a fast pace to meet up with them, to get to the line. Once you get to, you know, your opponent, if they run, you can run after them. If they don't run, you can't run them down. You basically have to kind of match what they're doing, if that makes sense. Um, I like it. I promise. That's, that's kind of how I describe it, because it, it does kind of add that, I'll call it, element of consent. If you don't want to fight while running, it's really simple. Don't run. And we should let them know that this is a woods battle with uneven ground, roots, everything of that nature, that running can be a problem. Yep. Yeah. What is, what is the terrain going to be? Is this, is this a, a semi-tropical kind of thing? This is Trimeris. It's semi-tropical and we're going to have to check for ants and alligators and snakes and cows oh. and everything else before we run this. Uh, yes, if you find something, um, if you find a manuscript for whatever, you do have to get off the field to go grab your thing. So it is, I mean, that's, that's up to you to go do it. Or you might be like, ah, I got this. Bob, here, take this, go get, you know, go get a shield. Can I hand it to a ghost? What's a ghost? Dead person. A dead person. No. Uh, no. Dead people are dead. dead people they cannot dead. hold things. So that's a good question. So here's my other question. You can hand off the super uh, Actually, Can you hand off points? Yes. Actually, you know what? That's actually, no, that's it. Then think about that. Hold on. Because that ghost theoretically has a regen. But they're not, they haven't regen yet. They haven't regen yet, but they're going to. But at that point, they're dead. They're simply moving in space to get back to where they can become alive again. So, ask, so all about, ask yourself this, what would be the, why would you not want allow, to allow a dead person to bring it back to the regen point where it could be used by somebody that might be there? Because you're using yeah, a then, dead person to do tactic stuff for, that live people should be doing. 
Right. We have a rule uh, against that. Yeah. So, but, and I mean, I realize we have a rule ish, it's not like written in stone okay. anywhere, but it's, it's worth, it's worth sitting here and going, hold on a moment. Is there a, cause my default was to ask me, I went, no, dead people don't do anything. But then well, I sat walk, there and went, am I just saying the that? <laughs> they walk back so to the beginning point carrying everything they have. So, and cause there's the thing. So let's pretend for a moment. Oliver and I are, are, we've made, you know, a little buddy unit. We're fighting, we're fighting. Oliver finds a manuscript that says rabbit. Um, and as he finds it, he gets killed. He would be allowed to take that and go back with that rabbit and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Oliver and I are fighting. I find this manuscript. Oliver still gets killed. Can I Wait, hand can it I to drop him? That? Oh, yeah, you're right. There we go. That's why. Because you drop it. That's, there we go. That's the answer. Dead people don't carry anything but regens, therefore dead people can't carry superpowers. Thank you. Good memory. Here we go. Right. This, is, this is why you ask these questions at, ahead of time. <laughs> <That's tough. laughs> um, we said match winning engagement. Um, we've, I put that everything, when you get killed, everything is dropped. Um, I think we said manuscripts. I kind of liked using um, my marking tape. Seems like something that could be, or pieces of cloth torn into strips, depending, you know, just what we have lying around. You need some um, duct tape, you need some manuscripts, and you need some flagging tape or something for your regens. Yep. Um, are regens, so there's a question. Uh, do regens and manuscripts look the same? No, I've, I always envisioned that regens would literally be like pink flagging tape then you would you would lay it in the manuscript and then roll up the manuscript and when you open the manuscript you go <gasps> regions okay could you then take the now empty manuscript and hide it back in the tree as a decoy <laughs> <laughs> why not <laughs> okay how are we how are we attaching these manuscripts yes that is i love you i'm just uh, i love you. That's wow, did you buy because I asked those questions? Because no, of that, because of that question. The other thing you could do is... is I was not even there yet, having, and you cut it off. The other thing you could do is the manuscript says, turn this manuscript in for a regen uh, cloth back at your res point. Oh, I guess you could say that. It's got three in it, and it's worth one more when you bring it back. And that way we're not littering the field with shit. Yeah. Let's litter the field with shit. We gotta pick it all up at the end anyway. Right. Um, and the only reason I like that is because it does make it easier to drop things. Mm -hmm. When you get regen, it makes it, you're not sitting there going, hold on, was this my regen manuscript or was this my, what was this? Mm -hmm. So um, how, are we, how are we distributing manuscripts? Are they rolled pieces of, I'll call it cardstock, whatever, paper, on the that we're putting on the ground or are we attaching them to trees i thought we were going to create manuscripts uh the day before mm -hmm. as part of an arts and science project or with the kids or something like that and then you're going to roll yeah. them yeah. and just give them a little bit of twine tie them up a bit of twine and then you're just going to go i out. wasn't even going to twine them because if you twine them to take too long to open true yeah just roll them tight up. yeah and then you just like you're putting you're like sort of sticking them in trees so you can see a little bit sticking out kind of thing right so if yeah. you walk by it and you're looking around, you should be able to see it. Okay, so they might be kind of like tucked near the roots. They might be um, put Just on Just like on a... Survivor, where they, okay. they have to go look for Not that I've ever watched that. <laughs> uh, I need my, okay, give me, uh, this was yellow. Um, regen is, uh, Say the word again, what is it called? It's the marking tape. Is it marking tape? Flagging what tape. Is flagging tape. It's like playing flag football. It really is an Easter egg hunt, Pietro. An Easter egg hunt with puncture wounds. Uh, multiple destinations starts getting complicated. Remember that anything that you do, I mean, I hate to say this, imagine the most air-headed fighter you can and realize that you're going to have a cut. Imagine Joe Average Fighter and realize that half of the fighters are going to be less able to understand a complicated scenario than that. Yeah, flagging tape. Flagging tape, yeah. I just I have a ton of it because I use it all the time in scenarios. Um, 
I think one of the things that kind of has to happen is some version of when the field is being reset by the marshals, try to get the teams to either turn their backs or walk away or some version of that. So they're not watching where we're putting things. Very good point. Um, I mean, honestly, that that's another thing of if you want to make this a kid's activity and make it a whole group activity, non-fighters can go hide stuff. Yeah, you know, kids kids can be real dicks when it comes to that. Kind of <laughs> I know. But so this is kind of a fun thing, though. The one thing that would be nice about kids is they're not going to discriminate against us five foot tall little buggers. Right. With, you know, all six foot, some six foot tall. All of us sitting there throwing, you know, manuscripts 20 feet in the air because he can reach them. <laughs> So, uh, we, but we, we will we'll let you stand on our shoulders, right? No safety. Two hobbits make one person. No, nope, there's a rule at La Rochelle because it's me. Uh, so no, no standing on people's shoulders. Okay, so, um, just to recap, and I'm gonna scooch over and make this one big uh, thing. Hold on a sec. Uh, let me go stick a. Ooh. Okay, because someone asked, because I should be able to do this in 50 words or less. Um, the win condition, oh, come here, text. Eh. <laughs> the win, can, why am I on top of something? You I think we can get rid of all of those. I don't know, you, may, you want me, I'll get rid of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah the that. win condition is collect point scrolls. That's the, that's how you win. You collect point scrolls, the most point scrolls. And it doesn't even have to be the most because uh, let's talk about that. And this might be, you guys talking about um, how many are there? Uh, well, they, so the, the, our king said there was 10 points, but of course we can shard out those 10 points however we want. Yep. Right. So how many point scrolls do we want to exist out there? Well, if we're going to run this multiple times, we can't really tie the point scrolls to the points that are given for the scenario. So it's just um, collecting so the most? Like, yeah, it, it's or you whichever side collects for any given version of the scenario, each run of it, they get three points. It'd be, it'd be really nice if we had 12 points to give out. Your Majesty. Ring, ring, ring. Your or Majesty, not. could we Nine. have 12 points for this? <laughs> deal or no deal? Uh, the king has decided you can have 12 points, but on the contingency that he doesn't gear up to get shot with an RBG 10 minutes in and doesn't get to play. Wait, we're not allowing RBGs. Easy peasy. Totally. Guaranteed. <laughs> so wait, he's, he's playing with? Okay. Oh. So collect the point scrolls. So we have 12 points to play with. Somebody, uh, Warwick and Oliver, tell me how that's waking up and what we're doing with scrolls. That's how many, how many point scrolls are on the field each time around? Yeah, if you win, four points. Three points. Yeah. So, okay, so how many point scrolls are on the field? Has to be an 11. odd number. Well, it just it's, it has to be an uneven number. Uh, let's what, let's it, do yeah. seven. Seven point scrolls. <laughs> if you win that scenario, that version, you get four points for winning. Okay, yeah. what do we, we don't good. want any version of, because there's a difference obviously between I won six to one versus I won three to four. Do we want any sort of I'd say that benefit that of over, that? Over I'd say that overcomplicates okay. it and also rubs salt into the wound. Got yeah. it, collect point scrolls. Yeah. So, that, so you, you gotta get four of them or you know, a majority of them to win the four war points. Yeah. Even though the war points. He gets you four points per run. Um, and we said we're playing this three times. Are we sure we don't want to play it four times? How long do we think this is going to last? Well, I'd say you'd run the first one, and if it's over in two minutes, you you divvy up your points a little more. <laughs> okay. And I'll, yes, I'll admit, do you have a suggestion in chat about uh, how this might pull into s scoring? Um, let me pull it up. What if we make all scrolls one point and the act of turning in the scroll lets you get the extra weapon? Uh, does that oh, since you have to leave streamline the field, your scoring? Anyway, that's not a bad idea. So he's, 
he's combining the two acts into one, which is which is nice. So because you've got yourself a manuscript scroll and you have to leave to get the point, like you have to carry it back to your regen point, um, he's suggesting we combine those, some of those scrolls have a symbol on them. Oh, this, this scroll has a rabbit on it. So when you go and collect your point, you can now fight case. But how do you, so you, you have the uh, superpowers. If you get killed, you lose oh, right. it. Yeah. That yeah. Is and right. the other person yeah. can pick yeah. it up. Yeah, that's right. But you got to drop it, the uh, scroll anyway, anyway. Yeah, that's right. And then you would lose you your killed. So you I wouldn't. mean, here's a question. Am I allowed to take a dagger, stick it in my belt and not use it until I find a rabbit scroll? No, because you can't use it until you return it back. No, because the rabbit scroll, I, I mean, I can. Well, the question becomes, do you get the superpower the instant you pick up the scroll or do you have to take that superpower scroll back to your side to pick up your weapon? You stick so it in your belt, Pasquale. If the answer is you get the superpower right away, people are going to want to have uh, weapon caches out on the field. Yeah, it's, which is not I think a you need it. It's just fine. Valid. Okay. It's 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 not just finding it. It's finding it and get it taking it back. That's two parts of points yes, you, you have to take it. back. Points you have to take back. Point scrolls you do. We're talking about superpower scrolls. So the I simple you, answer is you have to take everything back. The yeah. fun okay. answer is you can have weapon caches on the field. I maybe perhaps the way to describe it is you can't have weapon caches on the field because we try very much to discourage people from dropping stuff on the field, but you can put it along the edges of the field. Good King George's wife has seen your struggle and has created belt favors to be hidden in the superpower manuscripts and put on their belt. If they are killed, they get traded. Now, that being said, King George has an issue with your scenario. Of course he does. <laughs> Um, so, King George is kind of dumb. King George doesn't like the idea of having to go turn in the scrolls for points because it's complicated and how are you supposed to know who to push and all this other stuff. Is there any way to make the target more visible? That's what do you target. mean? Uh, target. So as soon as they turn in these points, they're taken off the field, right? How do you know who you're supposed to be killing to get those points so that you can take them to your side of the field? Mm. They're carrying a manuscript in their hand or in their belt. Okay. Yeah. okay. You kill anyone who has a manuscript. Okay. If I have, uh, if I go sword and, well, okay. So I have to start with single sword. Yeah, we make the. So if I get superpowered, I can't pick up a manuscript, another manuscript. <laughs> yeah. You have to have a free. You have, it has to be in your hand. The manuscript has to be in your hand. That's good, Westrick. Yeah. That's a, that's a good rule. I like that rule. And I, I should have said we have one hundred and ten percent. And also make don't make the manuscripts like this. Make them like two feet long. Large. Right. <laughs> They're scrolls. We could get. A, a ream of the construction paper and just those construction are paper is small. Bikes. You can go bigger. Get poster board. Well, poster board. Uh, why would you? Why would you want paper in a wet environment? Trimeris. Everything's wet. Right. So use cloth. Use sheets. So we can go back For to the to... manuscripts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the king wants to know. Can you parry with manuscripts? Thanks, Catherine. You can parry with your hand. Yeah. If you happen to have a manuscript in it. Oops. <laughs> All right. I don't so, think that they're going to be very sturdy. The, the, the king would like to uh, test play this now. Because we have an idea of what we're doing. You have points for scrolls. You have superpowers. If you get the superpowers and die, the person who killed you gets them, right? Yeah. I think okay, so. Say, is there anything that, dropped. that we think is overcomplicated that needs to be simplified? Because we've got a lot of stuff here. Okay, so the wind can um, that's why I'm writing this over and I'm going to make this bigger. I think this definitely needs to be bigger. Bruce, it's not, it's not so much that they the get the scrolls that you drop, that your scrolls just get dropped. If there's okay. other combat going on, somebody has to safely be able to retrieve those off the ground. Where's my undone button? So, Marshal in charge, what's the uh, site booklet right up? Uh, I'm writing the crappy version of it and we'll make it into paragraphs in a moment. Um, but that's what's coming over into this low speech bubble. 
Plug manuscript with superpowers. Wabbit equals two weapons, I'm gonna call that. Well, she's writing this up. I'd like to pick both Oliver and Warwick's brain on playtesting, the importance of playtesting and how you guys do it. Um, if you can keep it kind of brief and streamlined, since we have a lot of very complicated things happening on our screen, that would be awesome. But just talk to us briefly about playtesting and why and how. So uh, I don't know if you want to go first, Oliver, because I always go first. Okay. You should go first. Okay, well, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, playtesting is good. It gives you a chance to see how things actually work and give them a chance to break it before you get to the event. Uh, we do playtesting at a regional war practice that we do hold throughout the year within our kingdom. So we can do that. Um, and another thought, but I'm going to send it back to you. And So uh, for me, playtest, you could, I like to paper prototype things. This is what we're doing right here. We can see it. It's visual. We've got tokens. We can, what we can actually do at this point is we can, we can pick two, we can, we can pick a side, Oliver and I can each pick a side or whatever we can, you know, we can, we can bring our, we can bring our, uh, our moderators in and they can pick a side each. Um, and then they can start telling us what they do, you know, how they're, what their, you know, what their plans are, what their strategies are. We can move chits around and, and just sort of see what happens in those different situations. <clears throat> what I always look for are uh, fail states and a fail state is uh a condition where a, your rules uh, do not have an answer or somebody is able to take a rule that you've created and make the game unfun um, or the game becomes unwinnable because of something that they've been able to do. And I'll give you a really good example of, uh, of a fail state. Uh, in tournaments, we often have uh, single limb tournaments um, and we say uh, double kills or double death. Um, and you'll ask, you like, okay, so how are we going to do the finals? Like, where, where we get, we're going to, when we get to our top four, are we still single limb? And they're like, yeah, single limb, double kill, double death all the way. Well, that is a fail state because you could end up with no winners because if it's always double kill, double death all the way to the finals, you could end up having no winners. That's a fail state. So you need to look for those type of conditions when you're putting together a scenario. Can we get into a place where people are just standing around arguing because nobody knows what the right answer is? And that's why you have strong MICs who are able to step in and just make a call. Um, you often get fail states when you have to make calls in the middle of a scenario because of something you haven't play tested or you haven't thought of. And so you make a call on something and then it turns out that it wasn't a great call. And I've done that a couple of times. You just don't make the right call and everything goes to hell. So that's why in a situation like this, I would want to play this out just sort of in a role playing type of situation, just to see what people would do in, in, in certain um, when certain conditions are, are brought out. Right. Um, so the other the other question I have for you, I was kind of nice to you this one, much nicer than our playthrough, um, just because I wanted the audience to a be able to kind of see your thought patterns and um, procedures on this, but what would you do if this scenario was, let's say, uh, half the field was made unusable? Or let's say the king decided he wanted his band of knights and him to all be unicorns forever as a third party in this baronial war. How do you implement, sorry, I'm, I'm a jerk. How do you implement some of those changes on the fly? And what are some considerations for people who are planning events, um, planning planning scenarios, to 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 like think about now while we're talking about this. <sighs> well, the first situation that you gave, where you only have half the field, I would then create half the goals. Okay. Yeah, simplify, simplify it down. Uh, you definitely. get rid of half um, the manuscripts. Okay. Also the fact that sometimes when you introduce last minute changes like the crown doing so, it can literally break the scenario with no ability to bring it back and make it playable simply because they have changed it up so that the objectives or the resources are switched to a point where you cannot play this as designed. Uh, there. At that point, you do a little bit of pushback or you try to come up with something else that is a compromise to what they want 
that still allows you to do a do the scenario in the manner that it is playable and everybody still has fun. So that that's kind of my what I want to lead into is um, are there any like I, I'm sure there aren't tried and true ways to triage a situation like this, but maybe uh, while Hawk is finishing up her typing, uh, what's like the strangest way you've had to triage a scenario in the past? Successfully or unsuccessfully? <laughs> eh, both is good, but just keep it brief while we let Hawk finish up. <laughs> Have you got one, Oliver? Uh, no, you go ahead this time. I'm trying to think of one that would... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, trying to think of something that's viable to come up and talk about. Uh, the, if you lose either your hay bales or your other buildings or whatever, having, I mean, we, we've had to go with half the number of hay bales that we originally designed. So we had to put up tape in between hay bales, which worked more or less okay, except we had to keep, after every scenario, retaping because they, the tape would get destroyed halfway through. But it was enough to allow people to have a, a good idea of what they should not be walking through this wall of hay bales where you had three hay bales over 30 feet with tape in between them. Is this where we don't mention the D&D &D town battle? Right. <laughs> I had one where uh, the, the, the prince uh, had uh, entered the, the rapier field with a bunch of knights that he'd uh, trained up in RVG only and put fezes on all of their helmets and they were the fez uh, crew. Um, and he very much wanted every battle to have a lot of RBGs. And so we had to modify all of our scenarios to include uh, RBGs in, in every scenario. And there was always um, a uh, scenario that I always really enjoyed, um, which we called the Zulu War, um, because I'm Canadian, so it's a Commonwealth thing, of course. Um, ah. Well, you know. Um, and uh, in this scenario, what you would do is you would uh, put one side in a defensive position uh, with the uh, no regen or with unlimited regens, no, was it a uh, no regens, but uh, all their ammo. And then the attacking side had no RBGs, but they had unlimited regens and you would just time it out. And then you would switch sides and do it the other way around. And we, we did variations of that. And we just tried to add that mechanic into pretty much every one of the scenarios we already had planned out. And it worked out okay. It went, you know, some, yeah, of them, some of them worked out better than others. We had talked about this. I did something like that at an Australia War way back when the final battle of the day was over, everybody was in a long line for the King of the Hill, um, just on the King of the Hill, the uh, bear pit. And there was a hundred sensors in line just waiting around doing nothing. The armored people had given up for the day and they left their hay bale castle empty. So I took a bunch of people we went over, I started doing designs on fly, on the fly, just trying to get people to do various things. The people that use RBGs were like, how can we do this? I did not have enough marshals to control the area. So what I did is I built a small, and I called it the Alamo, uh, where I had them, all the people with RBGs inside the Alamo. I had unkillable powder monkeys, which could go out and glean shots, and they fought inside against the overwhelming force from the outside. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in real quick. I think Hawk has a question. To yeah, I, I just found a fail situation. Sorry, I, I was typing this up. And so we might need to make a small change. Um, here's the problem. What happens if my, because I'm sitting here going, well, how would I play this? Because when I start playtesting, that's my first thing. It's like, go, okay, here I am, I'm general. What's my rule? Is I would tell my guys to run as fast as they can, as far as they can into the forest, and start grabbing every single manuscript in sight and start hauling ass towards the west point. And if everything's uh, evenly distributed across, that means that it's pretty easy for this just to turn into a running battle. Perhaps you can only have one manuscript at a time. It's still a running battle, you just need seven runners. Or you um, drop any manuscript that's useless. I guess in that case, you do get the kids to hide the manuscripts. <laughs> so that's, that's option one is you hide the manuscripts better yeah. that's one way to fix that another um, option is that you can only score certain 
you can't touch manuscripts of a different team. I don't know. I'm trying to think of how to prevent that. Well, I mean, uh, I think everybody's going to be uh, your first one. That, I mean, you're going to. It's a big enough field. It's going to be. There's going to be a lot of woods. It's a really, really big field, right? It's a thousand feet. Um, so there's going to yeah. be a lot more places to hide stuff than there is stuff. So there's a suggestion in the chat about the possibility of uh, making the turn in location, not the res point. Um, what would be the pros and cons of that? And on this map that we have, where would you put it? Uh, the easiest way is you stick it on the other side. You turn it into the other, basically like basketball where you have to get it across the field. Uh, that's one of the easy ways to, to prevent uh, again, this is a really big field, so it may not be an issue, but that's an easy way to prevent anything from turning into a running battle is that you, yeah, king me, checkers chess, you have to get to the other side of the field. You have to get through them. Um, and and I'm, that is large field. Large field, a lot of running. That, that is a, a lot concern. of running. It's swampy, it's hot and humid. People aren't going to be doing a lot of running. <laughs> and even if yeah. we were to put the turn in point in the center, you create a concentration point there that may or may not be a line battle or a, a protect the center section from the other team being able to access it if they're both trying to get to the same point um, in the middle I mean, of the field. The other, the other thing that you can do is that you have a turn in marshal for each side dressed as a rabbit or a snail, yes. you know, whatever yes. however we do. Yes. And they, while they are not hiding, they are moving through the field throughout <laughs> and you have to get to them and you have to turn it in. We have to do this just so we have people in snail and rabbit onesies out in the field. <laughs> so Sounds the good. Other, the other question we had was as a commander, are you going to know where the manuscripts are hidden or is this one? No, no, I don't um, want you holding. I don't want you holding a clipboard. What? Yeah. What? You don't want me to bring the binders? got binders um so then <laughs> king george yeah all over the field <laughs> king george is kind of dumb and king george doesn't understand how many reses he gets how many reses do you get in this battle or is it only the region manuscripts right do you does everyone start with a with one piece of flag uh, one flagging uh, uh, tape so well, everyone's got one that's what we'd originally discussed. Everybody, so everybody basically has two lives to start. With. Okay. Okay. Or maybe we can give them each two. Right. So I think you would run it one time and see how it went, and then go. You know yeah. what? We could give them all three and let them play longer, right? Or we could do okay. reverse seniority where mods get one, grant levels get two, AOAs get three lives, and if you don't have any award at all, you get four lives. That's no, the opposite, Miguel. So that uh, so that your newer fighters get more lives than your more experienced fighters. That's what he said. Uh, Miguel was talking in chat about. Oh, oh okay. So yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, Miguel. That's it. So it gives you. So the the newbie that goes out there and he gets one shot by the mod. Boom! There's his one life. No, he gets four chances of that. I, I, mod I, I love should that. know better. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, the mod <laughs> sucks to be you if you if you get tagged. You're a fucking mod. Go kill someone. <laughs> wow, PLQs. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here's a question. What he's the, king, the king is going to ask, how many flags do I get? Because he's King George. How many he gets one. Three. He's a king. How many? Da, 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 da. <laughs> How many Riker awards does he have? He gets King four. George has unlimited regens, but every time he dies, he changes sides. <laughs> Ooh, that's me. And I'm not willing to deal with that much pay, with that much uh, duct tape. <laughs> so if 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 the king doesn't have any rapier awards, he should get four, <laughs> and one for the crown. So he gets five. He gets more than anybody else. And a pat on the head. Um, pause for a second, because one of the things I've said is that um, regen tapes can be handed from person to person. Does this mean that Joe Newby can choose to sacrifice his three flags and give them 
for mod because he thinks that they're going to be more useful? Or are these initial I mean, ones non-transferable? I think the initial ones should be non-transferable. The bonus ones okay. are rewards. So I do them as two separate colors. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So with this, and, and Hawk just brought up a wonderful point, what are some of the logistical concerns about planning? I won't say that this is a super complicated scenario, but we've demonstrated that even a small baronial war takes a lot more planning than most people know about or even think about. Um, what type of logistical concerns are there for this? Like what type of materials uh, are in your normal, like I'm gonna be Marshall in charge bag? Uh, so I'm going to I touch on that really quickly, but what we're seeing is that in a baronial war, you get a lot more complicated scenarios than you get at necessarily uh, a Gulf Force or a Penzik where it really is just lowest common denominator. Here's the field, kill everybody. Here's mm -hmm. woods. The and this goes back to until everybody's dead or until time runs out. And I think that's I mean, a, that's back a really to the original thought process where not all scenarios work with all, multiple different size of uh, uh, participants. So the larger the scenario, the harder it is for something that is fun like this to scale up. Well, mm -hmm. and additionally, because, and this is something that I think Hawk or maybe you, Oliver, said at the very beginning. Because there's so much on the line at a Gulf Wars or a Penzik, you don't want to gamble on your scenario and have people be upset at the end of it, right? Whereas no, something Pedro. like this, people are going to be a lot more relaxed about it and they just want to have a good time. And yeah, know your audience. Um, I love gimmick stuff. I think this is probably a little overcomplicated and I know I'm probably guilty of adding most of it. Um, <laughs> But I think, I think it, uh, uh, if we could simplify it in some way, that would be a pass that I would, that, that would want to do, is how can we trim this down? Because one of the hardest things you're going to have to do is the morning of this battle, you're going to spend 45 minutes explaining the rules. Yeah. So, and I, I will admit that if this was a baronial war, so anyone looking at this, we, we definitely went with the, I mean, with the people who definitely look at things like this and go, how can we make this really cool and interesting and never before seen? And if I was winning a Borneo war, we said that this was, you know, towards the middle, towards the end, this would be my one complicated one. Like I would make every other battle at this war, at this war much simpler than this. That's and this is my one wild, crazy, cherry yeah. on the top hookification. Yeah, this it is, is tape, right? okay, not, like, if you've been voluntold that you're now running, you know, some colonial war, it is okay if your scenarios don't look this psychotic. Especially if yeah. it, it's okay, you don't have to. We, we, we went for the AP version. It's okay. Yeah. You don't have to. We're, and, and if we're all a bunch of mods who, like, have fought the field battle, have fought the house battle, have fought the woods battle, have fought the hold the flag battle. And so we like to come up with all these intricate ideas, but you know, 80% of the fencing population, 90% of the fencing population isn't mods. They are really happy just to get out there and stab people and they don't really care what the scenario is. I'd, I'd like to also emphasize because we've been getting kind of in the weeds here a little bit, but not too, too bad. Um, that a lot of this, and I, I had planned on saying something at the beginning, but I uh, ADHD'd myself into not doing that. Um, this is a little bit, taking a look at the, the micro to learn about the macro, this is about planning a scenario. It's about a lot of the thought process that goes into it. And well, if you are ever MIC at a baronial war, or even a day event, or even Penzig, um, Hopefully this will give you some food, food for thought to chew on before you make the decisions that you make um, in creating your scenarios. So I just wanted to throw that out there since we, we've been getting a little bit in the weeds and I, I know I've had a few messages here and there about, ew, carrying things or ew, RPGs or ew, spears. And I, like, please, please, I hope that is not what you take away from this. <laughs> yeah, like you should, guys should be thankful I didn't bring in Madu's. <laughs> yeah. And understand, 
um, reason this is complex. This is why you do the play testing. This is why you get out there and 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 do a bit of this ahead of time so you can say, hey, it's too complex or this isn't going to work. So, but but if you have it this complex, you can always pare it down. True. But and it's harder to add stuff it, in. I'm sorry, Oliver. If you run it multiple times, the first time you run it, you get together with your war commanders on either side. You go, so what do you guys think? You know, how can we make this better? Well, let's just, you know, can we strip it down a little bit or can we do this? And then you do it, right? Because it's a baronial right. war and you just make it fun, more fun. Yeah. It's, it's and, it's, and it's not every scenario is going to work. Not a, it's, it's a learning experience. You've never done this before. It could bomb badly. But this is just one scenario of the entire day, out of the entire war that you're going on. If it bombs badly, as he said, you re redesign it. But you don't worry about it bombing badly because it is a Bruni war. It's like an oops. If it's Tenzik and it bombs badly, ah, you should have play tested it more ahead of time. I mean, I, I had to talk someone out of wanting cool foam noodle boats for a Penzik battle. And the only way you could get to engagement was by putting eight people in this pool noodle boat and get them to the field. And I'm like, how many fencers do you think we have? So <laughs> we did that. We did, we did that with the PVC tubing held together by yeah. rope. People had to carry it. But what he, what he'd done is my friend Richard had done this. He'd actually built a slingshot that a small person could sit on and it fired water balloons out of um, surgical tubing. Um, and this was in the middle of August in uh, BC. So it was like, like 85 degrees and really hot. Nobody had a problem getting hit by these balloons. So you had to like, you would, you would, you would run along with the boats and then you had to put the boat down and then the person would play with the water balloons. It was actually super, super fun. And it was really simple and stuff. People really do love stuff like that. Because if, if all, all your if if your goal is everybody has fun at the end and walks away with no shit there I was stories, it's a win. Nobody yep. remembers who won, right? Yep, but some of the logistical concerns, like it, it it's always a balancing act on figuring out how to ha let people have fun while not making your marshals want to go cry in a corner. <laughs> and and I think that, you know, when it comes to the idea of I've got this cool idea for a scenario, I've got this. Um, it does help to have that outside perspective of the play tester and the, the, the whole poker, really, the, the one who goes, well, what about, what about, what about? Um, if you've got something really new and complicated, send it my way. I'll have fun with that. I'm not yeah. sure about the rest of this panel, but yeah. I'm totally willing to volunteer to go through, your, to go through a, a scenario design and be like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Um, everybody, everybody, everybody knows that one person who loves to create <clears throat> scenarios, loves to find the rules yeah. to game it, not necessarily for advantage, but just to show how clever they are. Yeah, and you find you the have that lawyer in your life, you, you go, want them to look at your scenario. Yeah, right. You, you want them looking at it before they show up to uh, uh, questions for the marshal yeah. time, right before the battle. You so, want them looking at it like months before when you're planning it so that you're not answering their stupid ass questions. So something like this on. can turn into something that like this thing we just built. If it worked the first time, this is something that can turn into something people want to do over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they get better and better at it every time they play it until everybody already understands the rules. You basically are just going through your TRPs, your conventions, and off you go. And then at some point, it actually, because everybody knows the rules so well, it actually ruins the scenario in a way because everybody knows exactly how to win it at that point. And then you have to get rid of the scenario and come up with something new. Or change it up. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh, so we have a couple of questions popping up. Uh, Pasquale, the victory condition is at the top of the screen. Um, the other question specifically for this scenario real quick is, what happens when people run out of reses? Do those points manuscripts just stay out in the ethos? Or does the other team have to go hunt them down? Or do they automatically get the points that were left on the field? Um, that would be the quick question from one of my friends who, uh, <coughs> Pascal. <coughs> uh, 
who likes to break scenarios. I learned from the best. So, so um, basically what you're saying is that the Wabbit team, without the, you know, throughout this battle, um, I won't know, that's another thing I thought of, is having a whiteboard, because I'm an elementary school teacher, that the two um, Resmar, the, the, the onesie marshals is what I'm going to call them, give them a little whiteboard that they write on how many points they are holding on to because that makes it easy for me as the armic to keep track of how many points have been scored. And it makes it a little bit easier for the, um, the teams as well to be like, ah, there's three points ahead, but there's still two points somewhere on the field. And um, I'm calling them onesie marshals. I'm sure we'll come up with better words for them. No, I um, love that word. I love the idea onesie marshals? of putting our marshals in onesies. It'll be, it'll be hot though. Those things are always Those hot. Those poor right? Southern men and women's. <laughs> Yeah, maybe um, been, like mid in the east and and here. Whatever, whatever they, I'm calling them onesie marshals. They may be in tabard. Whatever it is, we make them very blatant and obvious. Um, another thing I stuck on. You put the you put the on top of their helmet. Snail. Um. So this like is this is something actually. Snail and ears on. Warwick the and I disagree with it. I never put my marshals in anything that looks like fencing armor because that's how they get hit. Mm -hmm. So I refuse to allow like marshals don't wear masks. Because that's how they get as hit. Don't have, as long as you don't have RBGs, that's fine. Yeah. And even when I have RBGs, I prefer doing goggles over masks, again, for the same Use reason. Use a goggle. But either way, so we have our onesie marshals. Um, another thing that I put in here is on those manuscripts, put the directions on the manuscripts. Like, on the rabbit map manuscript, you have an adorable picture of a rabbit, and you have something that says, take me to the res marshal to gain the power of this. Yep, that's, a, that's exactly right. For sure. I um, I'm so mad because that was actually on my that was on my little piece of paper. <laughs> Damn it! Uh, After eight years, Hawk has learned some things. Yeah, it's well, almost like she knows well, me. children for a living. <laughs> and, and 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 I realize, like I say that, but I'm thinking about let's pretend I was doing some version of this in my you know my second grade classroom. What would I? What do I want to do so that I don't have three hundred kids coming up to me every fifteen seconds, going, "Hey, Miss Hawk, Miss Hawk, Miss Hawk, what do I do?" So, uh, wow, that I, I like want to. I want to ask uh, John's question real quick before, and it's a complete step away from what we're talking from this scenario. But, what is the absolute simplest scenario that you can run that is still fun? Put all the people on the field and tell them to kill each other. Yeah, that's it. Yep. I usually end the day with the last man standing or last fight sensor standing. It's a, it's a res battle. You fight it until you're tired. And when you're tired, you bow out. And then when you get on the even side, you switch them up and it's everybody against everybody else at that point. And you just fight till the last two fighters are tired of fighting. Even, and even, oh, sorry, Oliver. Sorry, even a line, even a line battle, even a field battle can be a lot of fun if you go into it with the right mindset. My, uh, got that, swords, my, final battle, people. Usually, my final battle usually has nothing to do with the war. Right? Yeah. There'll be no points just, attached to it. It'll be a complete gimmick battle. I'll do zombies versus villagers. Mm -hmm. uh, that that I, was a good one. Sorry. So, um, Miguel asked or a question. If you have, so a different idea, I, I, you have a different definition for I, Valhalla I got battle. You, <laughs> but what I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> what I'm used to for a Valhalla battle is something that I love to end an event with, if it's a small event. And that is it's a grand melee, so every, everybody for themselves. If the person who killed you dies, you go back in. Oh yeah, that's our Valhalla back. battle. Okay. You're, you're, you're conflating that with the snowball tourney I was talking about last week. Maybe, that it might have been. Um, but the end that. result is that whoever wins has to kill everybody. And pretty much that takes such a huge amount of effort. And, it's, yeah. it, and like, that's so hard to do. Yeah. That it everybody either happens, it either happens the time. first, the, the, usually if people are fresh, they'll, somebody will run, run the line all the way through the first time. Um, and then the second and the third one take forever. Right. So back to the scenario. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually gonna deviate from that a little bit because Hawk was trying to bring it up because Miguel asked us a very good question that harkens back to our episode two weeks ago where we had someone ask, is there a good way to incorporate people's personas into um, scenarios? But what pass, uh, pass wall, <laughs> well, Miguel, sorry. Sorry, Miguel, you are definitely not pass wall. Um, so what Miguel wanted to know is I, 
know people who see melees as the opportunity to prove themselves as a, a good fencer, a commander, a leader, a team player, like especially um, giving them their opportunity to up that kill count all at once. How do you balance those people, and in my own words, as hungry or thirsty people, uh, with the fun factor? Can you appease them both? Or like, what are some of the considerations when you see that you have a thirsty boy or hungry girl uh, situation <laughs> on the field or in your kingdom? Offer multiple scenarios. No one scenario is going to make every single person happy. So especially yeah. when you've got this nice baronial war, well, we'll have one scenario where, you know, that this is kind of our fun and goofy scenario for the people who like, you know, cool, goofy, you know, these types of scenarios. If you've got, you know, make another scenario where the, the focus is, you know, kill, kill, kill. You've got the opportunity to, you know, offer a buffet. Yeah. So if somebody just wants to get out there and kill somebody, they just want a line battle, that's fine, whatever they want. I think if somebody really wants to shine, you offer them something like we just built because they can show, they can show their athleticism, they can show their swordsmanship, they can show their, um, their leadership abilities, um, they can show how well they can innovate and flex uh, in different situations. So uh, that is how people, because when people just, if they want to show how awesome they are, if they don't want to just be seen as somebody, I, I'm assuming they don't want to just be seen as somebody that can put the pointy end in the other guy. If that's what you really want to do, you're a duelist, go fight in a tournament. Yeah. Or even if you do, you can, you can kill people during a scenario, but you're just killing people at random. Does it, does it help your side in the long run? You get the ability to go kill everybody, but your side still needs to have strategy. All right. Yeah. War, war, sorry, Wistrick. War is a, is a, it's a team thing. And if you're all about yourself, um, you're actually going to be a little disappointed by war. <laughs> all right. So we keep kind of jumping around with play testing and looking at the scenario for the holes with just like a quick brief overview of what we concluded with this two-hour <laughs> marathon, um, which is actually a pretty short time to plan a scenario, having done it a couple of times in the past. Um, so quickly, can we go over what we came up with and do a very quick, like, if you were to play test this, what are some of the holes you see at a glance now, and um, how would you fix them? So um, one way that we can do this, and participants can, assuming you all know where the hand raising button is, one way that we can do this is that we can pretend that we are here at the event, and I'm gonna explain this scenario to you all. Most of you hopefully know this all already because we've got this lovely little speech bubble, essentially what I'm saying. And much like when we have everyone standing around and the marshals are explaining the scenario, some dude is going to raise his hand and go, well, what if I tear the pieces in half? So and this is actually what I poked Bruce about having right now is uh, dumb questions for the marshal time. So please give us the overview. And then if you have a dumb question for the marshal, if you have a question for the marshal, please like, post it in chat and I will communicate with the marshal here. Do you, do, you, do you want them to post it in chat or do they have the option of saying have them it post it. Please go ahead and post it in chat. Post it in chat. Okay. Um, and when he says dumb questions, actual questions like, don't don't be the five-year-old on the field for the sake of being the five-year-old. Think of a question that somebody would actually ask, yourself included. Like, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, we will be here all night long. <laughs> Do I have no. to wear tape? I, the blue we doesn't have match my been outfit. We in that Marshall's briefing. Every one of oh, us okay. has been in that Marshall's oh. briefing. <laughs> all right, so number one, everyone gather around. One of the things I think I talked about before is you explain the rules to everyone at the same time. Um, don't do it side by side. And especially with 60 people, I shouldn't even need my bow horn, but I have one in the back of the garage if you really feel I need one. So, welcome to the woods battle. Uh, some of these conditions are the things that we've talked about all war. We've talked about, um, so, I'm going to assume that previously in the war, we've talked about DFBs, matched running engagement, 
and RBGs. So I'm not going to go totally into them when I get to that point. So the one condition for this is collecting point manuscripts. If you look at these woods behind me, there are three types of manuscripts that are hanging around in these woods. Some of these manuscripts are worth points, and they look like this. I'll show a demonstration of what a point manuscript looks like. That's what you're trying to find. When you find a point manuscript, you need to give it to one of these handy dandy dressed onesie actors. So who they're giving it to. Again, it should be very plainly obvious. Warwick and Oliver. So the manuscript, Warwick and Oliver. Warwick, you want to be the bunny or the snail? Oh, I'm such, I'm such a snail. Oliver, you're the bunny. Killer bunny. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, some of these are superpower manuscripts. You find these manuscripts, you also need to take it back. You need to take it to the resurrection marshals that are standing at your red point over there. And they'll tell you what you do. So if you find this one, it's got a rabbit on it, and rabbits are super cool, and they get to fight with two weapons. So if you find this, you go over to your resurrection marshal, and you trade it in for these handy dandy belt tokens that our lovely Baroness made us. It says that you get to fight with two weapons. If you find this one with a unicorn on it, you get to fight with a spear. Same thing, you go back to the res marshal, you trade it in for a handy dandy res handy dandy token saying you can fight spear. If you get this one, you are now a snail, and snails get to fight with a secondary, a defensive secondary, either rigid or cloak, whichever makes you happy in your soul. Um, so obviously, don't do this when you're sleep deprived, by the way, it doesn't work as well. So those need to go to your res marshal. You cannot fight with a weapon you are not authorized in. So if you find a snail and you are not authorized in defensive secondary, you don't get to fight with it. The nice thing about these superpower scrolls is that you can trade these in for, with other people. You can hand it to your best friend who is authorized as a snail. You can hand it to your best friend who you don't really want fighting with, but they're authorized in it. So they can be handed from place to place. Normally at this moment, I'd say any questions so far. No, wait. If, 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 I, if I'm not authorized in snail, can I still take it and run it to somebody who is authorized in snail? Yes. And you can hand it off to them in the middle of the battle. Yes. What happens they if have, I have to be alive, however. Can I, can I, fight, double, can I fight double snail? Two bucklers? Yeah. Uh, do I need an empty hand to play with the scroll from Miguel? Um, I believe we had decided that early on that you need the scroll had to be in a hand and you can only have one scroll at a time. So hey, I'm going to hey, pause for a moment. And while we are allowing this and this because the three of us made this up at the same time, my suggestion when you actually do this is don't let multiple marshals answer. Have one marshal that gets to answer and only one marshal gets to answer because otherwise it will turn into the marshals debating it on the side of the field. So pick your boss man and, and they get to be the top. That, well, that's, well, that's you, Hawk, so go. Yeah, yeah. So, so Wait, everybody uh, an answer, yes, you can double buckler as a snail. You just look kind of silly. Uh, please remember the, the shield size restrictions that we've already talked about for this war already, which match golf wars. So fighting in Trimeras, it's always going to match golf wars. Um, in order to pick up a scroll, you need to have a free hand, um, whatever hand that is. Uh, but you can, if, if for example, you are fighting with a dagger, you can stick it in your belt. Do not drop things on the field. If you drop it on the field, congratulations, it has become the property of the marshal. That's in terms of weapons and bucklers and things like that. Don't hey, marshals. do it. Hey, marshals, if I'm armed as a rabbit, and I don't die, but I'm armed, and then I decide to suicide. Uh, do I have to give up my rabbit scroll? So, let me go we through the do not last- not talk about the D&D &D town battle. <laughs> so, uh, there's one last type of scroll that you'll find in the anyway, I should have gone through this before I ask for questions. The last type of scroll that you'll find in it are magical powers of regeneration. So you notice at the beginning of this, we've been handing out these handy dandy flagging tapes. If you are a mod, you got one of these. If you are, have a GOA rapier, you got two of these. If you do not have a rapier award, you got three of these. They're blue. But in these handy dandy extra regeneration manuscripts, there's some extra flagging tape in this lovely shade of oh my god glitter. 
because I wanted to make it available. Those flags that you started with, the blue ones, you can't trade those. But these, oh my God, glue are some extra regen points. You can pick these up, you can hand them to your friends, you can keep them for yourself, you can do whatever you'd like to do with them. To regen, you must go to the regeneration marshals at your regen point and trade in one of those flagging tapes. If you destroy the flagging tape, if you destroy the manuscripts, you have made the marshals and these small adorable children I have with me very, very sad. And you're probably going to go to timeout. Don't do it. Um, so when you are killed, anything you are carrying in terms of manuscripts drops. So that doesn't include the regen tapes, but it does mean the manuscripts. So if you are a rabbit and you get killed, that drops. This applies to suicides as well. So if you suicide, you still died, drop all of your manuscripts. But if you don't have any manuscripts, well, go ahead and suicide all you want. Uh, my friend Miguel doesn't wear a belt. Where can he uh, put his belt favor tape stuff? Fortunately, we happen to have brought random bits of rope to tie around your waist so that we've been basically providing crappy belts for you. Oh my god, I have been to that event. Just <laughs> Bring your own. Mm -hmm. Tuck them in your pants. Oh, 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 Westrick. Tuck them in your scarf. So I, By the way, if I uh, have a scroll, I, I drop I, it when I die. I added, a, I added a, a jail for you since you said there was Thank a you. Yeah. Right? What? Can I drop a scroll if I'm not dead? Sure, why not? Oh, sorry, I sure. can't answer that question. I can't answer that question. It only she only walk can answer that question. Sure. My one request is that uh, if you drop it and you choose to rehide it, remember that us poor marshals have to find them again at the end, so it needs to be visible. You can't you as you go through, you'll see they're they're semi visible. You cannot hide it in such a place that it can't be found again. Yes. <laughs> Is Wistrick always that guy? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, All right. God. No, I You know. may not I, just like, throw it off the side of the field. I would not ask that question. I would tuck it out of bounds and wait for, you know. Okay, everybody, come together. You can't do it. Wistrick just did. So legit, this is why Wistrick is part of my, hey, Wistrick, break this committee. I have a committee of people, and I hand it to them. And I basically go, okay, come up with how would you break this? And this is what they're here for. It's a, he's a valuable friend to have when you're a scenario designer. Take, every, the, every. take the MacGuffin, rehide it. Take the MacGuffin, put it where the other team can't get to it in any way, shape, or form. Even if you can't get to it, like if, if, if the real win condition is denial. Restrict, you, don't, restrict, you don't actually want to win. You're an agent of chaos. So, Marshall, yes. can I drop But if, my but if I assume that, like, my team has. Wistrick, two. shut up! Well, no, no, no. My team has two. They have one. <laughs> okay, Wistrick, so there shut are... up! My Bruce is speaking. Can I can I drop my superpower to pick up a point scroll? Ooh, oh, good question. Can you drop your superpower to pick up? Um, the short answer is yes, but you need to have a plan for how that's going to happen without you dropping weapons or defensive secondaries on the field. Okay. So if you have a plan where, you know, you have a dagger and you want to stick it in your belt, drop your superpower, pick up, um, pick up a point scroll, go for it. If you want to hand that point scroll and your buckler or end your dagger to someone else on the field who's authorized in it at that moment, you could do that. Marshals, well, do you have a reason why that wouldn't work? That would not work and Nolly? Can, yeah. can, can we carry two scrolls or only one scroll at a time? You need an open hand to carry a scroll, so only one. So if you dropped all your weapons, could you have a scroll in each hand? If you drop your weapons on the field, I will be very, very angry at you. If I, care, if I carefully, no, because if I, if you I are carefully, no longer a target. If I carefully, you. carefully put my spear up against a tree, and my sword is up dropping it. Field there, can I carry a manuscript in each hand? I think so. You are completely rules, unarmed. You're not armed. You are not a target. You're, it's not legal to strike you. I'm gonna, so my, my answer based on previous rules is that it didn't matter if you were armed or not, because if you had lost two arms, you could still stay on the field and you weren't necessarily dead. I'd honestly, I'd have to double check the current rules and make sure that how it's written doesn't have anything against that. My default is 
No. Um, I will not, hold on. I do this beforehand. Um, I would not let you lean it against a tree. When I say you may not leave weapons on the field, I mean you may not leave weapons on the field. I don't care how careful and sweet and nice and you are actually, about it. That actually solves the problem, so there you go. Yeah. I feel like I've got everything under one arm. I've got my spear and I've got my sword and my shield and a, a manuscript and I'm trudging off the field kind of thing, right? You cray cray. <laughs> so we've received this question several times, so I'm going to answer it, even though I'm not the marshal in charge. No, you may not get on the shoulders of the snails, even if you're a rabbit. What you do after hours is completely up to you, but no riding the snails. Thank you. <laughs> That's the drinking game at night. Green dragon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I had to get um, that. A hawk. Yep. So if I have a superpower, like a second, uh, I have a dagger, do I give up that scroll that gave me that so that I can get the dagger so I'm no longer holding you that scroll? So for the superpower scrolls, as it says on the scroll, you take this handy dandy scroll over to your regeneration marshal. That's the marshal standing at your res point, the place where you began, and you trade that scroll for one of these handy dandy vote tokens that are lovely, nice, um, Baroness made for you. And you tuck that into your belt or you can tie it around your arm. They're long enough that you can do that. <laughs> so does the belt token then stay with me if I die? Nope, you drop the belt token. Uh, Good point, so, I need to write that better. So if I'm about to die, thank you, Pasquale, uh, can I throw my scroll to a friend? About to die or dead? About to die. Sure. I'm or you know you're about to die. Do whatever you want. Oh, was it? Um, I my my short answer is that I do not want you chucking these across the field because they're made out of poster board and they are two feet by one feet. But you can drop it. <laughs> can somebody explain the belt tokens to me? I really didn't catch that. That was when um his Majesty said that Her Excellency had made belt tokens in terms of the what, what are they for? Superpowers. So Superpowers. Superpowers. You guys were debating so on how to show that. You mark the superpowers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Your Majesty, for adding an extra level of complication to what we are doing. I mean, come on. I was going to add a third party, but then we got so in the weeds on planning this that I was like, eh, let's just plan this. We got we got another hour, right? <laughs> well, I think we probably should add some tabards. <laughs> Only a hundred tabards. So this is actually something we probably would have come up beforehand. So I've taken that manuscript, I've changed it into a boat. You need, do you need an open hand in order to grab any manuscript? That's what we're saying, yes? Yeah. This is a question by Marsha, just making sure that we've all agreed on this. Yes. Let me add that. So what happens if my off hand is taken while I'm carrying a scroll? You may choose to trade that, um, to put the manuscript in your weapon hand and you've lost the use of that weapon and you know, good luck run for it. Or you may choose to drop the manuscript, up to you. <laughs> How should one carry their sword when they have a manuscript in the hand? You shouldn't have a manuscript in that hand. You put both of your weapons in the other hand. So here's my, here's my sword, here's my dagger, here's my manuscript. I do this. I'm now, I'm now and actually, my, I do this. I'm carrying my sword yep. like this now, and I have the manuscript in my other hand. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, and you may not so use it. Thank you for that. Yeah, and it obviously it is a dead. You should not be using that for parrying yeah. purposes. So, if, so. You, if, you, if you don't have the ability to defend yourself, and I come on the West Coast, what we do is if you can't defend yourself because you don't have a weapon or defensive capability and I get within striking range, you're dead. Cool. Tremendous because doesn't really have that. That's going to be a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is a very interesting discussion and cultural discussion that I kind of want to work into another one of these episodes. Yeah, because we handle it differently on the West Coast too. Yeah. Uh, Dragon Bolt handles it differently if you get your pommel in people's faces and then the South has the thing about don't kill the queen. 
and armor, <laughs> really only you know, shows up in golf have wars. A completely different culture on the field about you know, this guy is right next to you and has a sword, and he says, "Hey, I'm here," and that varies from kingdom to, king, to kingdom as well. So that's let's get back on track. That's on the list. That's a different topic. Write that right. up for next week. Yeah, let's. let's Any other? Oh, we're already planned. <laughs> Two weeks. We're already planned. So I, I, I feel this this scenario is probably, if it was if it, if if the uh, complexity was out of five, I would give this a four. Maybe a four point five, and I think a three yeah. is probably about as high as you want to go in complexity. So I would this scenario would be one that I would want to make sure I had a really good write-up for. I'd want to make sure, I would even call like the commanders the night before and say, so I've got this really cool thing, but sit down, have a drink with me. We need to go through this stuff. <laughs> you need to brief your troops on it. I mean, I would do it hopefully way before the night before. Sure, but, yeah. And, uh, and this nice. is like handpick your marshals level yeah. of complexity. It is. Uh, that's another kick is train your marshals beforehand, have a marshal meeting beforehand, make sure all your marshals are on the same page before you even have this marshal city chat. So I have another question here. This may be another I IKA. Um, do you show this information before the war happens? I mean, you sh is it, so this, this information, these scenarios are presented on the website months ahead of time? Yeah, I don't know I've, we're gonna get I've months presented, plural, I've presented but... scenarios like this. I've actually modulized the information and just done like a preliminary like teaser about the scenario. And then like two or three weeks later, I give a little bit more detail, right? About what people, and then I just sort of like trickle the information out. And then at the end, I lay out all of the conventions for combat, uh, which seems to lessen the blow somewhat and people seem a little bit more able to to handle it and they're a little more prepared for it and i've had a lot of uh, success doing it that way i will also say that when you do something like this we're planning we've taken an hour really to do this not two hours to do this this is something that we'd be doing six months out hopefully and you have that time to go in more detail to talk to more people to do some play testing to actually get groups together and try to to get this to run ahead of time to work out more details and take out all the bugs that are in it and not just have to come up with this at, in two hours and then go play it on the field. So there is the, you do iterations of fine tuning and tweaking and getting this out over the course of time. Oh. I'd, say, I'd say if you're, you're gonna design a scenario, you could look at a scenario like this and pull one or two things out of it and say, I really like those things. I wanna, I wanna make a scenario built on that one mechanic. Right, rather than try to take all this, because this is a this is a. So, one of the really really easy ways to simplify this is you just do it as unlimited reses. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. We get rid Instant of the simplification. Red. Yeah, and I mean, so the other thing about doing this um, beforehand is that the more in advance you do this, gives you time to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and go, ah, oh, crap! How are we gonna wait a minute? Um, yeah. Which I mean, you guys literally watched me doing it. I was typing this out. I went. Oh crap, how do we stop this from being a running battle? That was something that I've had a running battle once, it was terrible. And I mean, that's kind of your shower thoughts. It gives you that time to have those shower thoughts to go, I mean, do I really want to go find glitter flagging tape? I mean, Chrissy's going to kill me if I ask for 100 tabards. So actually, stuff like really that. Like, but it gives I really you... like your idea of making an unlimited regen because it actually takes one third of the complexity out of it. Yeah. And probably drops it down to like a 3.75, 3.5 out of uh, out of five in terms of complexity, which makes it pretty workable, really. So there you go. Uh, what, what, what would be the difference between a 3.5 and a 3.75? There, like, how would you trim that last <laughs> quarter <laughs> of a point off quit, of quit that? Calling out, quit calling me out, man. So I'd like to just point out really quickly for the audience that's still with us that this is some of the fine tuning stuff that would occur in those months leading up to your event. Like I have this really cool thing and then you talk to your best friend who's going to marshal for you or whatever um, and they go, are you sure you want to do that? This is what would happen next. 
Uh, and like, if you look at what what uh, what Hawk just did, you can you can look at uh, by striking that text out. You can imagine how much more simple just reading that out would be, right? And it's like uh, when you design things, you have to kill your babies because everything she struck out was was the stuff that I wanted to put in. It was I was I was like I want regens, I want this, I want that. But you have to be able to look at those things that you that you you put into the scenario. It's something that you think is awesome, and you have to be willing to pull them out because it makes it better. I mean, and we've it eliminated be... a lot of we've eliminated a lot of stuff along the way. We came up with a whole bunch of ideas, options, thinking out of the box, trying to come up with stuff. Not all of it stuck to the wall. It, a lot of it just slid down. And so yeah, don't don't get don't die on the hill that you want to keep everything in if it doesn't work well. Absolutely. Fun is the goal, right? So I know Pascal especially is asking a bunch of questions about um, about carrying manuscripts and how you carry manuscripts and stuff like that. And it may literally be that I sit here and, and especially because he's, Pascal's probably one of those people who I'd end up putting in my, you know, break it scenario committee. I go, hmm, let me think on this. Because originally we said, okay, you can only hold a manuscript if you have an open arm. Maybe we say you can have a manuscript and you can, you know, hold it behind your shield, you can shove it in your belt, you can only just have one at a time. Not sure. That might be something that I sit and go, you know, I said I said you had to have an open hand for it. Maybe I decide I don't want to do that. Maybe that's that's allowing Pascal to come up with a million different really, really complicated questions, which are legitimate questions. Maybe I go, eh, it, screw it. You can take that scroll and just shove it in your belt. And we're back to IKA again, is that on on the West Coast it's simple. You you can't be defenseless on the field. And if you put two weapons in one hand, you sound the safety then, you can't actually use your your sword while holding a dagger in the same hand. That's unsafe. There's no safe way of doing that for anybody. So it's like if you've, and we talked about this early on, is, is that if you have two weapons or a weapon in secondary, you're not allowed to pick up a scroll. That was a simple simple point is that you've you've got a superpower but what you give up this is the monkey's paw you give up the ability to pick up scrolls that's another good way to fix it mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, and just noting pasquale being the breaker he's the person that i channel when the mid realm asks me to break kenzik scenarios for them <laughs> Yeah, the questions are great. I'm reading through them. They're perfect. Well, and there's, a, uh, that's also a consideration based on the turnout you get day of. Like, if you have 100 people, okay, no, one particular person doesn't need more ability to pick up a scroll. But if you get, like, if there's a hurricane, if there's rain, if only 40 people turn out, okay, maybe in that situation. Well, you make fewer power scrolls. Right. So you have fewer people who have that issue. Yep. Yeah. You just and when you look at stuff like that, you do it in percentages. It's like have I got half as many people? Well, let me look at all of this stuff that I I brought into this scenario. Let's do half of it, or two thirds of it, or whatever, whatever feels right. And then you you look at it in, in, in gross in grosses like that, right? You, you make large changes, not small changes. So the same I'm way, if you wanted to, you could say for RBG ammo, you look at everybody's got twenty shots for this the scenario each side it, and if you've got twice as many people you give them 40 shots it's it's scaled so one thing um one thing to consider is that when you're looking at um when you're looking at things like golf wars you don't really get to make a lot of the kinds especially like the scenarios are set ahead of time they are negotiated they are you know signed sealed delivered contracted etc cetera, etc cetera. It's a lot harder to make those changes on the spot. Something like this, where it's a baronial war, um, you'll notice in my scenario, I didn't say how many superpower scrolls we're going to have out there. Because chances are that's something I'm going to change. So I'm just not going to say. We'll say it when we get to the field. Um, or I might kind of talk with my, I might, you know, go, eh, there might be about a uh, five to ten of them. Um, so. Uh, it's kind of a joke that I, I tell new teachers is remember they can't see the kids can't see your lesson plans So, you know, if you don't show your lesson plans, they don't know that you didn't follow them So you kind of have an element of that that can show up in this as well of you know Which is also a little right? dangerous because that's how you get bit too. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's finding that that balance of 
what are some things you think might be slightly adjusted on the field that would be easy? Number of flags is an easy one. Yeah, go, with, go always go with the easy, right? Yeah. Like taking out the Weegen thing at the last minute, that's a little bit harder. That's something that I need to probably make a way, make a, a decision on, you know, well beforehand. And I think that I think going to the limited region probably oh. improved this quite a bit. When we get into discussion of why we see the same old thing at wars, at, at inner kingdom wars over and over again, versus this sort of flexibility we have, it's back to the uh, hawk, what you mentioned of you get handed the scenarios. You don't get that flexibility. And even when you do, there's, there's a slight, the desire to stick with what works. Because I mean, I gotta be honest, like if I, we've gone through this, pretend I spent six months on this, you know, this is what I came up with. As we've said, you know, when things break at a baronial war, whatever, it's, it, we're there for fun. When things break at Penzik, <laughs> it's a little bit more of a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing, if things break at Gulf Wars, it's a bit more of a big deal. Um, and that's, that's where that size and what I also call the seriousness really, really matters. Because, I mean, this could be a baronial war that people take very, very seriously. It's going to be a lot harder to have really, really flexible things. It can so be back done. back to know your audience. Yeah. Um, another thing that we didn't really talk about that sometimes shows up in terms of audience to think about is um, whether you're expecting a lot of newer fighters or not. And obviously most of the time you don't usually know. Sometimes you might get lucky and know. If you do, that's something that can sometimes affect what you're planning as well. At Gulf Wars and Penzik, you have to presume you're gonna have a mix of both, right? You're gonna have all, at Gulf yeah. Wars, you have all the spring break fighters. Mm -hmm. And with, uh, with Penzik, you get a lot more interference from the crowns. Uh, Pasquale just pointed out, like, day four of Penzik and the war has been a complete blowout. Like, what do you do to fix the scenario so you don't have another one? Um, what, what can you do? Field battle. <laughs> Depends um, on why it's a blowout. Mm -hmm. If it's the sides are vastly uneven, that's easily fixed with the crown's permission to even up the sides if it's because you have more like six times the number of mods on one side versus the other again you can you can even out the ability for the mods to be stretched over it, 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 it really depends well why is it a blowout like that's yeah. really what the question becomes like is it a blowout because of tempers on the field? Well, that's one issue. Is it a blowout because it's been raining and every field is slippery and terrible and makes things unsafe? That's a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. Is it a blowout because the crown, you know, on Monday of, of Penzik said, hey, I want to ride horses in the middle of battle. Well, that's another scenario altogether. <laughs> that was Monday's, Monday's thought. That was Monday's. Which I, nice yeah. has a strong back. I was a yeah, lot. A couple of nights. <laughs> I was a lot meaner to you on Monday. I'm sorry. This is true. Oh, now, now you have like scenario planning PTSD. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I just kind of wanted to wrap up what we went over here. Uh, back to the discussing this being kind of the spirit and the overview of some of the considerations. Not all. We couldn't do all in the two and a half hours we've been here, but some of the considerations for scenario planning, um, we tried to explain a little bit about what type of situations go into the thought process behind planning a melee scenario to make sure that it remains fun, um, such as where the event is, how big the event is, what parties the event is between. We've just heard a lot about how a baronial war or a, even a, a, especially a day event is very different from Penzik or Gulf Wars where there are a lot of um, egos and tradition on the line. Um, we've also discussed how having 200 or 600 fighters is much different from having 50 or 20. Um, we've seen here 
a very big difference in how we would plan a scenario on a wooded terrain versus an open field. And next time we do this, if we do this again, uh, we definitely should do the open field. Sorry, audience. Um, just to show a little bit more of the, the thought process that goes into planning terrain for people that's not given to us. Um, other things we've discussed are pieces that change day of or even in the scenario planning itself, whether it be requests from the autocrat or the crown or the marshal in charge or even the weather. Um, and I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, for taking the time to plan the scenario out. And I would like to hand it over to Wishwick for the classic way of wrapping up these panels, which is no shit there I was stories. I'm not sure what he had planned for this week, but haha, -ha, you get to plan it. King George says so. Oh, no oh, shit God. there I was. And I sat in a panel where they made me make up a scenario on the spot. Yeah, two what's hours. The, what is the most insane idea for a scenario you've come up with um let's start <laughs> not this one not oh, this. not the test one either on your own let's start with define the insane yeah i don't um this will cause headaches someone will get somebody killed and i will have to do a lot of paperwork is it the D and D town battle, or no. did you put it on an actual movie? We rubbing? do not talk about the So, I mean, here's the problem with that because my job is not to create scenarios that do that. I don't. Yeah. I don't make scenario like the only time I've had to do scenarios like that is where King George went, "Hey, I've never fought Rapier, you know, in five years, but I made this scenario, and no, you may not change it, and no, you, no, I don't agree that this is unsafe." And, uh, oh God, and no, I didn't play test it with anyone. I haven't even talked to anyone rapier, but this is what you're gonna do. What's the first thing you look for in breaking a scenario? Um, so my personal version is that I do two things. The first thing I do is I go, okay, let me pretend I'm running this scenario. I'm gonna fight in this scenario. How am I gonna win it? What would be my instant, okay, go win it, okay. Did that make this really unfun for anyone? That's probably a bad thing. And then my next one, um, I guess it's three. My next one is that I think about what would someone more insane than me, like Wistrick, do if he showed up on the field and he's like, I don't care about this war, I just want to make chaos. What would he do? What would Wistrick do? To be fair, um, that's you at War of the Wings. By oh. request. Don't you be calling us out. No. By request. <laughs> for those not and familiar, then, War of the Wings. Three answers, maybe Warwick and Oliver want to answer? Um, and so the, the, the last thing I do again? is I picture what it looks like running, and I think of things that would go wrong. Yeah, what's the first thing you added... look for in breaking a scenario? Yeah, same what she does. You, you sit there, you pretend you're a person fighting, and it's like, okay, these are the rule sets that I have been given. What can I do? And, and, you know, I channel my inner Wistrick and go, hmm. But uh, I'm not as good at it as you are. But yeah, it's, it's, it depends if you want to be. I'm okay having enemies. It, there's, there's two ways of doing it. There's the fun, how can I screw with it fun way just to be, just to be cutesy. And there's how can I be a monster? I'm going to use the word monster instead of a Richard. Uh, to because one, you can actually have fun and sit there and say, Everybody else is going to have fun and laugh at this. The other one is, You've just ruined everybody's day for this scenario. So, um, I, I tend towards the how can I do things that are fun and make people laugh by doing something strange. I, you know, if, if you if you can take the MacGuffin off the field. Uh, or give it to a child or something of that nature and have have it run around, but it's still in play That's one thing if you if you hide it in a tree or underneath a hay bale where nobody can find it And everybody spends 30 minutes looking for something they can't find that's not fun. So You know you, you try to design your rules like you know you, You're asking us a question that we would turn to you and ask you because you do it better 
I I am adding to my repertoire. We appreciate that so much. Warwick. Uh, I look at it a little a little differently. Um, uh, I have a gamer background, and so if you hack the rules, you're usually punished. So what you want to do, and this is what how my brain works, if I look at a scenario that somebody has built, I'll look at it and say, how can I hack this within the rules and win? Because I really like to win. Um, and if I can't hack it within the rules to win, how can I hack it outside of the rules to win? At which point I go and tell the MIC that I can break their scenario um, by hacking it outside of the rules because um, they haven't thought about something. So I much prefer to find a way to win within the rules, um, and then my conscious will not let me, will not allow me to work outside of the rules for that win. And I, I think that's actually the way we should always look at scenarios, uh, because there's people that are going to do both. There's always a Wistrick, and there's always an Oliver, right? And I suspect Oliver wants to work within the rules to win, and Wistrick just wants to watch the world burn. Wistrick likes to find the gaps in the rules. Right. What's all those fires behind you? The I mean, burning. Yeah. I, mean no. I will, I will uh, say. Uh, the yeah. Dothraki charging as light melee into a it's, mass. It's the world burning. <laughs> in the well, at least it's not La Rochelle. Battle scene ever. So, <laughs> I mean, so I'm going to. So, Warwick, you actually have a question that, and I'm sorry, I'm going to derail on this. You have a question that you've asked in that you asked in the previous episode um, that I don't hear actually asked as a way for breaking scenarios. And it is basically how can I make this not fun for other people? Mm -hmm. Right. And and that's a really in, that that's a perspective. So coming from that's, the East Coast where it's Pinzik and Gulf Wars and it's 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 about winning. That's a very different perspective on it's scenario a breaking. It's a razor, right? The razor is fun. The razor is always fun. And the the concept of a razor is if you have a rule, if you have a situation, if you have a scenario, if you have uh, anything that you've added to it, you look at the idea of fun and fun. If fun is the razor, and you take this thing, this concept, this idea, and you throw it against that razor it should cut away anything that's not fun. And only fun should be left behind. So if anything you're, and, and, if, and if what you're doing isn't fun, if what you're gonna do is gonna make it unfun for people, you suck. Yeah. I mean, ahead, I, think, I think, I'll be honest, one of the nice things about having my little committee is that it lets, because, which you may correct me, Wistrick wants to find the gaps. He wants to find the places where this melee can be broken. But he doesn't necessarily want to go onto the field and then do that because yeah, it would I, make it unfun I for others. I haven't actually been on the field with Wistrick that I know of, but I'm pretty sure fun is also his goal. Yeah. And so by having so that committee and allowing... Goal, they stick around and then I get to stab them again. Right? Yeah. I mean, and so having that committee of people kind of gives an outlet for people like, like you find the Wistrix and you go, look, I've given you the chance to find all the gaps. You are my, I hate to say this, this is the same thing you do with kindergartners. You are my special buddy. And your job is to find all the gaps. So, and that way they're doing it in this it committee keeps, in a good yeah. place. So in my, that, industry, that holy selfish, in my industry, we do the same thing. In my industry, yeah. we reward the people that can break your shit and then bring you the broken ship, yeah. right? So the, those hackers, those people that can take the things that you've built and broken it, and then they come to you and they say, here's how I would break this, you reward those people because they are treasures. They ensure that things are going to be fun. And, and that's the and, difference here is that they bring it to you so it could be better. Yes. Rather and, than- uh, to, to sort of like, like I find the places where it can be broken, but I still want everybody to have fun. Somebody else out there might go looking for the places that can be broken and not care about everybody else having right. fun. And like I've been so when somebody brings a scenario to me and I say, this is how I'll break it. 
that's saving me. That's like making sure that all of my friends have fun so I can get to stab them at the next event. And I've been in your position before, Wistrick, where mm -hmm. I've been able to break down a scenario and I've taken advantage of it, but I've wanted to make sure I didn't make it suck, right? You always, it, it, you know, if you can own a scenario and still ensure it's fun for everybody, like, you know, you threw it out of bounds and or whatever, like that actually sounds really cute. Like that kind of stuff is awesome because you're not doing it to win. You're doing it just because it's, it's funny and it's yes. cute, right? That's fine. That's the type of shit that we should be doing mm -hmm. because you can always, you can survive that. Nobody's going to get into a screaming match over that kind of stuff. Well, if it's the only thing you can win with, it's a single MacGuffin, it does break, right. but yeah. I mean, yeah, like the, there is a certain amount of scorched earth victory to that I suppose. approach. But can yeah, you recover, it's can you recover from like, it though and go again and have a good laugh <laughs> as long, you know, as long as you can do that, it's okay. And, and, and like, like, yeah, especially if you're running it multiple times, break it the first time. Yeah. Let the marshals go. I, I should have thought of that. That's I'm right. dumbass. Fuck you, Wistrick. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's happened more than once. Uh, <laughs> Let's do, right, it again. The, do it right. We're, uh, and we're going to make a Wistrick rule this time. There's more than one. Right. Bruce. And at the end of the day, over the campfires, what you want is those no shit there I was stories and those people talking about the awesomeness that they had playing that day. And talking that's about what we really want. The, other side of the campfire from them not the person they don't want at their campfire yeah mm -hmm. like you want it, it like i want to win but i want to make sure that if i show up to the other side's camp they'll still what? like pour me a beer exactly because mm -hmm. yeah. otherwise exactly. i've lost okay. yes exactly yeah. i mean a great example of this is we were fighting a melee, five on five melee against wistrick uh the rule was no knee walking his entire side got legged and he went no new walking. Okay. And proceeded to what I can only describe as zombie crawl himself across the field. No. Him, hold on. Inspire others to zombie field. You're right. He put himself in lotus position, pushed himself up on his arms, and walked on his hands across the field. And, and mind you, part of what made it work is that the people who he knew who he was fighting against, he knew it was a group that would look at that and be like, oh my god! Yeah, it like, what a it, trick! It was my friends in the turnip farmers who looked at me and went, you son of a bitch. Well, you got to know your audience, right? Yeah. Also, yeah. Play to the crowd. Yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. And so I, we are uh, now at three hours. Oh. Yeah. We, we may choose to end the recording here and um, <clears throat> people may hang around and we'll let you turn on videos and you can chat as you want to and you know worst case scenario is i'll take host to it off of wistrick right. if, if he needs to go put a baby to sleep no baby went to sleep before this started otherwise i could not do this because <laughs> uh, baby's room is through that wall so i just want to say you guys have been amazing and i'm really you know like i know some of us have met each other in the past uh at gulf wars because that's i don't do a lot of pensic but i do a lot of gulf wars and i know we bump into each other um but we've done this is like a third time we've done this now and this has been really amazing and i really like you guys it's this is really, really oh, cool whoa, so for, 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 i'm gonna bruce you want to speak for us <laughs> no are we at i love you man Oh, is yeah, that where we're at? <laughs> i love it no oh we are Cooper at I love you, man. Yeah, no. Oh my God, is that in that bottle of brandy? It's it only started here. Oh okay, I, yeah. I was worried about you for a second. No. But I I'd like to say thank you, uh, anyone who stuck through to the end, anyone who's watching the recording. Thank you so much for coming and listening to what we say. Um, we are really, as uh, Miguel said in the chat earlier, we really are trying to touch on the philosophy of Melee and making Melee better without being too self-indulgent. Um, and we couldn't do it without you guys, and we definitely couldn't do it without our fabulous panel members. So I want to thank uh, Warwick, Oliver, and Hawk for all of your time over the last month. Uh, with the initial panel on episode two and this panel with episode three and all the prep work in between. And I hope we get to do this again. I'm not even going to throw out the little, uh, the little papers. I'm going to put them in a Ziploc baggie and put them in my desk so that if we decide to do another Who scenario is it anyway, we can 
pull them out nice and easy. Um, next time you're going to be hard on us, right? Oh, next time I'm giving you a blank map and I'm going to say it's this big and then I'm going to King George you as hard as I did during our play test. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm still proud of our play test scenario. Like, that was a pretty good one. I know. I, we I enjoyed that one. We definitely need to maybe uh, take a screenshot and publish it on the new Fighting the World group on Facebook. So if you haven't hit us up there, please do. We're trying to collect all the videos and make them a little bit more streamlined and easier to access um, while still paying homage to the Virtual Academy of Eurasia. So I just want to say thank you everyone for being here. I hope you learned a little bit about the philosophy and logistics of planning scenario um, in real time. And I hope it was at least a little bit entertaining because what's the point if it's not fun? And we're going to... <laughs> We're going to end the recording here. So thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next time. King George, how do your performances end? <laughs> ready? 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 da 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 da